double down uh, on our efforts to catch up with uh, science and technology and innovation. Science and technology and innovation, these are indispensable in the modern economy, in the modern world. Uh, the problem being that, you know, while uh, we have our uh, PhDs here, there aren't enough of us. And um, everywhere else in the world, for research to be successful, you need a complete research group. It's very important that the PASA members and uh, scientists based in the Philippines are continuously in contact so we will know the needs of you know, the Filipinos and opportunities um, that the Filipinos can have to uh, do science um, with their PASA counterparts. I think um, that is one of the good programs that they keep on supporting some of the initiatives of our researchers and scientists here in the country. The role of this uh, cooperation among these government agencies really is to be able to attract uh, science and technology global-based companies to set up shop here. And that is really key in terms of developing the science and technology innovation ecosystem in the country. We really need to ratchet up the appreciation, the recognition of the importance of science and technology and innovation. And um, we are all um, trying to uh, uh, attain what we call uh, the common good, the, the greater, higher, long-term good of the Filipino people. Good morning, everyone. Gisela Concepcion, PASA president here. Thanks for joining us. We will wait a few more minutes to start our event as people are still logging in. Thank you. Hello, Giselle. Good morning. Good morning, Tito. Thanks for How joining. Are you? I'm fine. Good morning, Gisela. Uh, oh, Mahar is here. Hi, Mahar. Well. Yeah. Hello, Mahar. Morning, Lino. Good morning, um, National Scientist Emil and uh, DR. Thanks for joining. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> morning, Mike. Good morning. Good morning. Everybody. Ben, good morning. Good morning. Everybody, good morning. Good morning, morning. Uh, <laughs> morning, everyone. Hi. Yes, you pros. Hello, pros. Hello, hello, Tito. <laughs> yeah. So great to have everyone at short notice. Yeah. Thank you so I much. Sent, I sent Gisela a, uh, a lead to the inquirer article of Randy David yesterday. And I think this yes. sets up a good uh, background for what we are doing today. Absolutely. I shared it already. I yeah, I saw it, it myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So as always, our uh, fireside chats are informal. And at this point, I'd like to um, recognize uh, representatives from media. And I'd like to thank you for joining us. And um, also from the AFP. We'll wait a few more minutes because um, people are coming in. Okay.
I'm addressing this to my co-host, Dr. Michael T. Are our speakers here? Are all of them here now? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Dr. David and uh, Dr. Vallejo are here. Uh, and uh, Father Nick Ostriaco has sent his uh, recorded lecture for this morning. Will he be joining us for the open forum? Yes, ma'am. After At about 10, 10 in the morning, he's just in a conference at the University of Santo Tomas. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, Paase conference. Good morning, everyone. So I'm hoping that um, our uh, Paase administrator is still here and can uh, post our poster. But if not, I will be the one to do it. <laughs> just a moment. Oh, there you go. All right, so I think it's time for us to start. Thank you so much, everyone, for being with us today on behalf of uh, uh, my co-host, Dr. Michael T. of Rokta. As we know, um, uh, this uh, fireside chat of PASE is gaining popularity, and uh, we address uh, basic issues relating to um, STEM education, and also issues uh, of um, great importance today, uh, like um, COVID. So um, for those uh, who are attending our PASA Fireside Chats for the first time, this is the 24th episode. And let me tell you just a bit about uh, PASA as its president for 2020, 2020-2021. So PASE is um, the Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering, and it's composed of about 470 PhD level scientists and engineers and medical doctors who are based in the Philippines and uh, elsewhere in the world, uh, many in the United States, and uh, we are Filipinos. So um, we aim to um, bring, um, well, uh, science, scientific research and applications uh, closer to um, uh, society, uh, you know, to, the, to benefit society. And um, well, um, today we are hosting or co-hosting Octa fellows or researchers who are in the limelight and they are about to face um, Congress who is looking into uh, the uh, qualifications and the operations of OCTA. And I think uh, it's clear at this point that while many of our OCTA fellows are good standing um, UP scientists, OCTA is an independent research group. Okay, let me just tell you a little bit more about OCTA and um, This is from our Octa uh, fellows. And uh, this is that um, Octa is an independent multidisciplinary team of scientists that has been providing data analysis, forecasts, and recommendations for pandemic management for the national and local government officials in the Philippines. Naturally, we expect Octa to be um, controversial to a certain extent. This is uh, not a government entity, but makes use of government data. And uh, looks like um, in the past and in the present, government is listening to Okta, okay? Which um, raises some questions with some of our other scientists and experts. Now, um, recently, um, Professor Emeritus Randy David of UP, who's a columnist of the Philippine uh, Daily Inquirer, uh, wrote an article on probing Okta and questioned why uh, Congress, which does not have too many uh, scientists, experts, would be probing Okta. Well, we do have our UP Diliman School of Economics professor, Stella Alabastro Kimbo, who's now a Congresswoman, who is into the uh, investigation. But we think that uh, this, this fireside chat will serve the purpose of having the work of Okta uh, well understood 
and uh, vetted by fellow scientists and engineers. So I think this is a very important uh, uh, occasion to try to thresh out differences, like what data does Okta make use of on the government and what data does it not use, okay? So at this point, I'm uh, very pleased to introduce um, some um, important people who, are, who have joined us today. Uh, we have national scientists, Emil Javier and uh, Dolores Ramirez. We have, um, uh, well, presidents, past presidents of PAASE. And I may miss some of you, but um, I'd like to mention um, uh, Toby Dairit, who is also a NAST vice president. We have um, uh, Gonzalo Sarafica and um, a few others. And then we have current uh, well. members of the PASE. Um, well, I am glad Joel Fellier is here now. And we have other PASE board members like Felino, Eno, um, Alan Sigan, and uh, a few others. Then we have the executive director of the UPD uh, ERDFI, that's the Engineering Foundation of UP Diliman. A uh, special mention of former DOH Secretary Manolet Dairit, who's also a PASA member. We have uh, PTV's Maricar Cinco. We have um, uh, representatives from UNTV and TV5. So uh, Michael, did I miss anyone uh, before I introduce you? Yeah, I'd also like to uh, recognize the presence of Professor Emeritus Mary Ann D. Abraham of the UP College of Medicine. Will you, you're coming in a little topic. Will you please uh, let me know again oh. who is Professor Emeritus of UP so College? Professor Emeritus uh, Mary Ann D. Abraham. Oh, fantastic. So thank you so much. Uh, Professor Emeritus for joining us. So, um, Michael, you're coming in a bit uh, choppy, but let me now move on to introducing Michael. Dr. Michael T is a professor and vice chancellor in UP Manila. He is a fellow of the Philippine College of Physicians and Philippine Rheumatology Association. His research interests include development of biosimilar monoclonal antibodies against rheumatoid arthritis and vaccine as a treatment for systemic lupus erythematosus. His team developed UP Lift, an app for peer-to-peer -peer counseling to help address psychosocial wellness of UP Manila students. In response to the effects of this pandemic in our lives, Dr. T published several papers on the mental health impact of COVID and the use of saliva to detect SARS-CoV-2. His team validated the protocol for the Philippine Red Cross, uh, which is so far the only DOH approved saliva-based RT-PCR test for the detection of SARS-CoV-2, working very closely with Senator Richard Gordon. And I say the impact of this work, Michael, is very uh, important because you, uh, you, you, uh, you achieved uh, bringing down the cost of the COVID test to half, okay? And uh, you contributed to a um, greater number of Filipinos being tested for COVID. Uh, using a PCR test. So um, thank you so much, Michael, for co-hosting this. And now I would like to give the floor to you to uh, give us more information about Okta and to introduce each of our speakers. Thank you. I'd like to now welcome our uh, uh, esteemed PASA member, Stalwart, former secretary of the NEDA and professor emeritus of UP, uh, Dr. Ernie Pernia. Michael? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Professor Concepcion. Uh, thank you to Paase for this opportunity for our group to explain the science behind models 
looking at the uh, opportunities and pitfalls of modeling. Yes, OCTA is an independent multidisciplinary team of scientists, and we are happy to present the science today. We have a lineup of four speakers, and let me introduce them one by one. Uh, Dr. Fredegusto Guido David will be our first speaker. He is a professor of mathematics in the University of the Philippines. He obtained his doctoral degree in biomechanics, an interdisciplinary area that utilizes mathematical modeling and engineering methods to come up with solutions to medical and biological problems. His other areas of expertise include artificial intelligence, game theory, mathematical finance, and discrete mathematics. His outstanding works in his field has led him to become one of the 10 outstanding young scientists in 2010. He was also an adjunct professor with the Asian Institute of Management and co-host Pinoy Scientist on Radio, Radio Aguila. Uh, can we spotlight uh, Professor David? Professor David, uh, can you open your video? Hi, thank you. Uh, mag start na ba ako? Hindi pa. Uh, I will introduce uh, Reverend uh, Nicanor Ostriaco. Reverend Ostriaco completed his Bachelor of Science in Bioengineering summa cum laude at the University of Pennsylvania and then earned his PhD in Biology from MIT, where he was a fellow of the Howard Hughes Medical Institutes. He was ordained a priest in the Order of Preachers in May 2004. He earned his pontifical license in sacred theology, in moral theology, also summa cum laude, at the Dominican House of Studies in Washington. Father Osriaco currently serves as a professor of biology and professor of theology at Providence College in Providence, Rhode Island. He's also professor of biological science and professor of sacred theology at the University of Santo Tomas in Manila, Philippines. He's working on an NIH-funded study on yeast. And during the pandemic, he pivoted his ongoing research efforts to developing a yeast delivery platform for a COVID-19 vaccines for the Philippines. Father Ostriaco recently received a 2021 Outstanding Scientific Paper Award from the National Academy of Science and Technology of the Philippines for research paper describing a mobility-guided model for COVID-19 pandemic in Metro Manila. His paper was published in the Philippine Journal of Science. Our third speaker is Dr. Regina P. Burba. She is a professor at the UP College of Medicine, where she heads the Division of Adult Medicine of the Department of Medicine. She is also head of the Philippine General Hospital Infection Control Unit and Infectious Disease Section of the Medical City. She is a graduate of the UP College of Medicine, and she took up her internal medicine residency at the Medical College of Pennsylvania, USA, and her infectious disease subspecialty at the Philippine General Hospital. Dr. Burba is among the first to publish about the early experiences on COVID-19. Her paper published at the Clinical Epidemiology Global Health Journal on the early experience of COVID-19 patients in a ter tertiary hospital in the Philippines identified specific issues that affected initial response to surge capacity, including the prolonged turnaround time for disease confirmation, the need for a reorganized hospital space and staff, and the need to increase level of awareness of ongoing COVID-19 community transmission. Dr. Burba is one of the clinical epidemiologists of the OCTA Research Group. And if uh, Father Nick Ostriaco has two summa cum laude, Dr. Burba is a mother of two summa cum laudes. Finally, our fourth speaker, Dr. Benjamin Vallejo Jr. is a professor of environmental science in UP Diliman. He studied environmental statistics and oceanography at the Bermuda Institutes of Ocean Science and at James Cook University in Australia, where he received his PhD in marine biology. He did postdoctoral training at Louisiana State University on molecular genetics 
and Biogeography. In 2016, he was Exchange Professor of Environmental Science at St. Norbert College in Wisconsin, USA. In 2017, he trained under the International Network for Government Science Advice on science advice during pandemic emergencies under Sir Peter Gluckman, the Chief Science Advisor of New Zealand. In 2021, he was nominated to head, to head the Philippine component of SCAPE or Evaluation of Science Advice during Pandemic Emergency. He also heads the Comprehensive Science Research Program on the Environment of Philippine Ports and Harbors and advises the Maritime Industry Authority and the Philippine Coast Guard on science and technology issue. Ladies and gentlemen, these are our four speakers, all of whom are fellows of the OCTA Research Group. Good morning. May I now call on uh, Professor Guido David for his presentation. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Michael P. and uh, Professor Concepcion. And good morning to everyone, all the uh, esteemed guests, uh, media people, media guests, and other guests. Um, I'd like to share my screen. Um, and in, instead of talking specifically about our mathematical model, which I, actually I have discussed in, uh, in several venues, uh, I'll spend most of the time talking about the data that we use, which is actually very important and perhaps even more important. Well, I would say more important than the mathematical model because as people would say, if you use the wrong data, then your output would not be very reliable. Like they say, garbage in, garbage out. So, but this is just to show you the trend in cases in the NCR. Two days ago, we had 2,800 cases, the highest it's been since um, uh, May. But also, we could see that there's a pattern evolving that is sim similar to the pattern that we saw in new cases back in March 1. In fact, this is why we actually um, made the, uh, well, or, you know, published a report a week or two weeks ago that uh, we're seeing a surge in its early stages. It's evolving because if you look back, we see that it's it's also, I mean, it's mirroring, mirroring almost exactly what happened last March. Uh, what happened last March was that we had a lockdown that we be, believe could have been, well, um, well, it, the lockdown happened when we were at around 4,500 cases. And the effect of this lockdown was that we had to lock down for seven weeks because at the point when we had the lockdown, the number of cases was already high. So our position was that, you know, if we are to have a lockdown, it's optimal, more optimal if we have it earlier so that we can reduce the length of the lockdown, okay? This is the reproduction number that we're looking at. And Dr. David, guess, one, one moment. Are you able to share screen? I am not sure if your, your screen is shared. Your screen says, is not shared, uh, Guido. So oh, um, it's, it's not shared. So, sorry. Yes. So Requesting technical. Be, no, our poster will be automatically bumped off once you start sharing your screen, Guido. Okay. Well, it says on my part that I'm sharing the screen, but I will repeat it. Um, I will repeat the process. And I'm not sure if you're seeing this now. No, not, not yet. Uh, please, uh, the I technical side. team should uh, stop sharing her screen. This is Paase Fireside uh, yeah, screen. So, um, yeah. Uh, it... so, um, sorry. Um, so this is our um, um, technical guy who's now uh, traveling. And um, let me just connect with him uh, quickly, please. Okay, uh, he said it was supposed to be an automatic um, thing. Um, Giselle. Giselle. Yes. Screen. Pardon? 
we can see yeah. the screen. I know that's what we're trying to fix now. And um, mm. I mean, we can see uh, the presentation. We saw the two graphs of Guido. So it's working. Yeah, we can see. You can see also. <clears throat> yes. Okay. I, uh, the screen is, on. screen is on. Sorry, but not all of us could see it. So that's the thing. It's great that you um, uh, are I can see it. it. All right. Now you can see it. So I guess we've done, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, so good. Go ahead, Professor David. Go ahead, please. Okay, thank you again. Sorry for uh, that technical difficulty. But uh, this is uh, what we are seeing in terms of the number of cases. And this is what we're seeing in terms of the reproduction number. And as we mentioned, we saw the, in fact, we saw the earlier indications um, more than one week ago that we were going to have a surge. The premise here, or what we are seeing based on past history, past data, is that when the reproduction number starts increasing like this, um, you know, we need major interventions to stop the um, cases from swelling or to slow down or decrease the reproduction number. So I'd like to talk about the reproduction number because it's been talked about a lot. And uh, uh, some argue that we should not be using the reproduction number, but it actually is the um, indicator. It's the variable that has been used worldwide uh, to um, project the number of cases to determine trends. And uh, I believe the uh, um, UP COVID-19 pandemic uh, uh, pandemic response team also uses the reproduction number to make the projections. So why is it the primary indicator? Basically, it measures the rate of inf infection and essentially it measures the speed or the strength of the pandemic. And that's why this number is very important. It's like a temperature. So if it's high, it, it means that you know things are getting bad. If it's low, things are improving. Now the positivity rate, which is the number of people who test positive given the testing is also a strong supporting indicator. And we can usually cross check an increase in positivity rate along with the increase in the um, reproduction number. Now the healthcare utilization um, uh, measures the impact of the pandemic. Okay, so just to make the distinction, if for example, we're talking about the typhoon, which you know Professor Mahar is the uh, the expert on. When when we're talking about the speed of the the wind, and uh, you know the the direction, the trajectory, we're we're using these indicators uh, to to measure the strength of the of the typhoon. But the you know, but when you look at uh, the impact of the typhoon, when you look at houses that have been destroyed lives that have been lost, we're looking at the impact of the typhoon. And um, for us, you know, that would be uh, an incorrect way to, you know, to say that, you know, you know, that, you know, we should start evacuating when we're looking at the, you know, the number of damaged houses already. I mean, in, in that regard, because we're looking at the impact rather than the the indicators or the trends, then the uh, signal would have been too late to say that, hey, you know, we should evacuate. So um, the reproduction number that, that we calculate is estimated based on the number of new cases, of course. Uh, there's no other way to calculate the reproduction number. So we, we will have to look at how we look at the data here to calculate the reproduction number. Um, so data is key. You know, if you use good data, you'll produ produce good results. If you use wrong data, then you can produce wrong results. Now, um, for the Department of Health, uh, they publish three uh, types of data for cases. One is the report date, which is the, da the, the date the case was reported. One is the specimen date, which is date the date the specimen was obtained. Uh, that's how I believe it is and the onset date which is the date of onset of the disease yeah, although the third one uh, is supposed to be the most reliable data here because it gives tells you when the person had the contracted the disease uh, but 
um, uh, well, I'm not a medical professional, but I'm sure some of the doctors here can add to the challenges in determining the onset of the disease once, I mean, what we do know is that a person gets tested. I mean, they may show symptoms, they get tested. And then once they get the result, then they have the report, which is the report date. But the you know, date of testing, you know, you know, it's a, it's a factual date, but you know, uh, you know, backdating it to the onset date uh, is is also a challenge in itself. And what I can say is that um, the most complete uh, data here would be report date. Um, the other uh, data are not as complete. Uh, there will be blanks, but that can be that's not a problem. We can always um, proxy onset date to specimen date if it exists and proxy specimen date to report date, uh, which of course exists. What I mean is we can fill in the blanks with just the report date uh, on the safe side. And this uh, um, issue was actually already considered in our July 2020 report number 12. So more than one year ago, we looked at the differences between looking at onset of uh, the onset date uh, case reports and the um, uh, re sorry report date and also the uh, specimen date or date of collection or testing date um, and, and we looked at we saw a strong correlation uh, but this was you know past data so now now let's look at what we're seeing now uh, in terms of the Department of Health data so. Um, uh, I tabulated some of the uh, data from Department of Health, and uh, they have actually separated it into three files uh, for 2020, and then from January 1 to June 30, 2021, and from July 1 to uh, present 2021. So what that means is I'm looking at um, data where the report date is, is from July 1, the present. So when I, uh, uh, well, I have a, um, an extractor. When I use the extractor to look at the data, um, if I'm looking at the date of report, these should all be zeros because this is uh, as far back as January 1st. But what, what we can see is that if we look at the data for onset, then 169 of these are supposed to be, are supposed to have an onset of January 8th even though they re were reported from July 1 to present. Um, but this is interesting. Um, you know, there's 169 for July, uh, for January 8, but none or almost none for January 9, January 10, etc. So w why is this? Well, um, if we plot the three data types, onset, specimen, and report, of course, all the report dates, which are the blue, will be located from July 1 uh, to present because that's, you know, that's the nature of it. They're, uh, they're reported from July 1 to present. So we look at the specimen date and the onset date, and we see that the, there are some you know, outliers from January 8, February 8, March 8, April 8, May 8, June 8. Wait, doesn't that, isn't that uh, interesting that they're all on the 8th? Well, of course, uh, what we strongly believe is that these were actually interchanged. It should have been August 1st, August 2nd, August 3rd, August 4th, August 5th, August 6th. Why it was interchanged? Well, I, I can't say, but well, um, and some might may ask, well, if you're seeing this, you know, why aren't you reporting this? Well, um, we've seen this in the past and, you know, we don't want to get into data issues. This could be uh, sort of a minor blip. And we're mainly looking at the report date, which is the most complete. And we believe it's the most accurate because this is the number that we hear every day. You know, we, yesterday we had 9,000 cases. That's what, that's what we hear. So uh, these are actual cases. And uh, from what we know, um, these cases that have been reported will tend to be validated and uh, studied so that they can get the actual onset date and specimen date. Um, but again, as I mentioned, um, there could be some data errors, even as we look at onset date 
and specimen date. So, I mean, this is a typical error, but this is not really a big problem for us, um, you know, in terms of the percentage error, you know, you could attribute this to error um, overall, your data should be fine. So, you know, it doesn't re really bother me enough to uh, point this out, but let's look at now at the, how the three data are correlated, onset, specimen, and report date. So this is actually a plot from July 1 to August 5. So, so the, or yeah, until Pretty August morning. 8. Right, so this is the same data as here, but I just expanded it from July 1st. And you can see uh, some level of correlation, but it looks like the report date is a little lagged behind onset and specimen, which is fine. I mean, that's what we expect. So, so this is this is something we see, um, but it's fine, you know, uh, because if it's lagged and we're aware that it's lagged, then you know we can uh, use that in our data analysis. You know, you could we could tweak our data to account for the fact that it is lagged. How far it's lagged it is? Well, of course, as you can see, um, for onset and specimen date. They're basically zero for the latest date, which is, you know, possibly very accurate. You know, um, dates, uh, sorry, cases reported yesterday were probably not cases that were tested yesterday or were acquired, you know, cases that were acquired yesterday. So, so what, basically, what we want to know is what is the correlation so that we can use the data to, you know, uh, maximum advantage uh, based on the the data that we're given. So um, this is, sorry, this is a picture. Well, I mean, the, the eye test here tells us that perhaps, you know, it's lagged by about a few days. So this is the picture. If we um, align report date with um, specimen date two weeks, uh, sorry, two days ago and onset date three days ago. And we can see that there's a, um, a fairly high level of correlation. I mean, even without the statistics, just looking at the, the figure, it seems to be highly correlated. So what does that tell us? It tells us that if we use the report date, it's very highly correlated with onset date from three days ago. It's not 14 days ago, as some critics are claiming that our data is wrong in for the you know over the past 14 days is unreliable in fact it's highly reliable as long as we understand that well what we're looking at yesterday is data that was you know minus three days four days so so that would be four days ago um, is that a big error no i mean uh, or is that a big problem no because firstly uh, we understand that what we're looking at is really three to four days old and that's fine. That's not a big, uh, you know, change in terms of our projections. Uh, but this is, um, you know, just to put numbers here, this is the correlation of report date with onset date. And we can see that um, minus three days, what that means is if you look at report date today, that's highly correlated with onset date three days ago, because there's almost a 0 0.9 level of correlation. And that's actually the highest correlation, and it reduces, it decreases um, after that. Now, there's another factor here that I would like to mention. Uh, if we're looking at data three days ago, um, yeah, you could say, well, it, it could be, you know, an approximation. So it could be a sort of a mistake, a slight mistake that we're looking at it, you know, slightly lagged. But the point is that if you're having an increase in the reproduction number, then the reproduction number three days ago should actually be lower than the reproduction number today because it's increasing. And you know, even for a non-mathematician, I'm, I'm sure that would make sense. If it's increasing and you're looking at three days ago, it should actually be lower so that what we're saying is that the reproduction number that we're using is actually a lower bound. What that means is it's a lower estimate. That means the true value may be higher. 
is that a problem? It's not a problem because we're looking at a more conservative estimate. And our proje projections are based on that. And that's why a lot of times the numbers actually are higher than our projections. Is that a problem? I mean, in terms of the mathematics, in terms of you know um, pandemic management, it shouldn't be a problem because, um, well, unless you want a more precise pandemic management, but what we're saying is that uh, if we're seeing a surge with the lower reproduction number, then a, you know, a higher reproduction number would indicate still a surge. So um, just to summarize what I have said, reproduction number is the indicator that we use to forecast uh, new cases, and it measures the speed or strength of the pandemic. And the positivity rate, we also use it as a strong supporting indicator. Um, case reports, which we use, have a high degree of correlation with onset of cases, minus three days, and date of specimen, minus two days. So there's a small lag, but that's something that we accept because even given the three-day lag in the event of a surge, this serves as a lower estimate of the true reproduction number. So I hope um, I'm going to end my talk here. So uh, thank you so much for listening again. And um, uh, I don't know when the question and answer will be, um, Dr. Mike, but you know I'll be here to answer questions if any have. Thank you. Thank you, Professor David. Uh, we will try to finish our, our presentation for now and then have an open forum after everyone has provided their uh, inputs for the lecture. Our next speaker will be uh, uh, Professor and Father Nick Ostriaco. I believe that the presentation has been uh, sent. May I request a technical team to show the presentation? There is no sound. In the meantime, I'd like to recognize this morning. Oh, go ahead. Um, okay, so um, I'm uh, running this uh, video of Father Nicanor. And uh, yes, Michael, please introduce our yeah. other videos. It's In the meantime, I'd like to recognize uh, the presence of uh, Dr. Ted Derbosa and uh, Dr. John Wong, who are also in the audience who is also in the audience. I'd also like to recognize the presence of former President Fred Pasqual. Okay, so may I Sorry, play sir? video now? Yes, ma'am. Go ahead now. This morning, I would like to explain the science and art of modeling pandemic hospitalizations in the Philippines with a focus on the NCR. My goal is to provide a layman's overview of how and why we do the modeling that we do for the sake of the Filipino people. I'm going to begin with a very famous quote by the world-renowned statistician, George Box, who once said that all models are wrong, but some are useful. And I think this is important for us to deeply appreciate with models. Life, reality is so complicated that all our models are necessarily going to fall short. However, our hope as modelers is to make a model that provides information that can be helpful for us to understand the shape and the dynamics, in this case, of the COVID-19 pandemic in the Philippines. So how do we model future hospitalizations during this pandemic? So I like to begin by the most significant challenge. And I think everyone who does modeling in the Philippines is deeply aware of this challenge. The challenge is that the DOH data, uh, like most data around the world because of the, because of the nature of the pandemic, has problems. 
especially the data from the most recent two weeks. But this is, this is, this is a very significant challenge because the viral incubation period for COVID-19 is two weeks. So if your data, uh, the limitations and shortcomings of your data is two weeks long, then we, you're, you're going to struggle to try to anticipate the behavior of this virus because it means that the pandemic can change dramatically within a two week period. Now, there are different ways to solve this challenge, to approach this challenge. And I'd like to compare and contrast two ways. So the DOH, based on what they have said over the last couple of days, uses the average healthcare utilization rate over a week or a two week period in order to try to frame the trajectory and trend of the current pandemic. Now this is subject to reporting problems clearly because not all hospitals are going to report all of their uh, admissions on a particular day. So there's going to be some delay, but it's also important to acknowledge that the healthcare utilization rate is a lagging indicator because people who get infected are hospitalized not immediately, but often a week or even two weeks after infection. So if you're looking at the healthcare utilization rate, if you're looking at healthcare hospital, hospitalization, you are really looking at the pandemic two weeks ago. Now, in contrast, Okta uses the average R or reproduction number over a week-long period. Now, we are, I think all of us in Okta will acknowledge that this too is subject to reporting problems and um, our critics have noted this and we acknowledge that. However, in response to that uncertainty, as I'm going to demonstrate over the next uh, couple of minutes, we don't simply focus on one R, we're looking over a range of possible Rs that, that, that hover over um, the, the, the seven day average. And we're especially looking not for absolute values, but for trends. And this is really important to appreciate. It's not really important if the R is 1.1 or 1.2. What's important is uh, whether or not that 1.1 or 1.2 is above or below last week's R, which say could be uh, 0.8. And if this is the case, then regardless of whether or not it's 1.1 or 1.2, what you see is that there is a, um, the pandemic is increasing. Now, again, uh, what I'm going to uh, emphasize is that all models are wrong. Some are useful. So this is really important to emphasize. That's why it's not really important to get our models precisely correct, because we know we will never get them precisely correct. We want them to be useful. So how are some models useful? I think the important thing here is to look at forecasts. Are the forecasts of the model uh, useful for understanding what is happening and what will happen over the next few weeks? And so I would like to examine our forecast for ho hospitalizations in the NCR over the past, say, eight months. And I would like to ask the question, were they useful? So I'm going to go back to an Okta research press conference from March 19. This, if you remember, was just before, was actually during the second surge, the alpha beta surge in the, uh, in the NCR. And at that point, we presented three different scenarios with a range of reproduction value, reproduction number values, 1.9, 1.7, and 1.5. And what is really important to highlight is that we noticed that regardless of the precise R value, whether the R value was 1.5 or 1.9 or anything in between, our hospitals would exceed critical capacity by Holy Week, which is the first week of April 2021. This is why we recommended that the national government take immediate action to prevent our hospitals from being overrun. Now, what actually happened? Well, as everyone knows, uh, our hospitals in the NCR reached capacity, and in fact, we're exceeding capacity exactly when we predicted, the first week of April. And these are two, two news articles taken from the Philippine press, dated April 7th and April 9th, both uh, pointing to the overwhelming occupancy of our hospitals. So it's clear, I think, from that one experience that our model was, was useful, and tragically, though, uh, the forecasts were ignored. Now, moving on to an Okta research press briefing on April 3rd, this was a few days after the second ECQ was imposed on the national capital region. And a lot of people then were asking about 
How long would the ECQ take? How long would the hospital crisis take? Uh, and this, of course, was my area. Like, how long would it be before we decongested our hospitals? We ran our hospital projections again. And again, these are very crude spreadsheet uh, models, but they predicted what the, it made two predictions. One is that the, the hospital occupancy would, would peak in the NCR uh, in the middle of April, around April 15th. And we were also able to predict that the hospital occupancy would be above 70% for the entire month of April. And this is what was important to say. Now, what actually happened? So if you look back at the data, what is this is the DOH data. It turns out that the cases did peak in the NCR on April 15, 2021, with uh, 8,018 cases. And you can see that in the curve that is presented in this NCR data uh, image. And we also were able to show that the cases did not drop below the 70% critical level until May 6. And so both of these predictions uh, bore fruit. And so again, our model was useful. And we actually know because we've been told that hospitals in the NCR use these forecasts to make plans for optimal patient care. Now, most recently, just a week and a half ago, on July 28th, in fact, the, the birthday of my deceased father, uh, we made projections again. Uh, and this time we did we, we based the projections using not R, but the experience of our ASEAN neighbors to simulate growth of the pandemic. We wanted to compare and contrast the Delta surge in Thailand, the Delta surge in Malaysia, and the Delta surge in Vietnam. Why did we do this? We did this uh, for two reasons, in my view. One is that uh, because of limitations in the DOH data, we don't have the genome sequencing capacity that other countries do. We were not able to know, I did not know, the precise ratio of the alpha, beta, and delta variants in the NCR. And if you really wanted to model this exactly, you would have to know the relative uh, proportion of these variants. Secondly, there, there are so many vaccines that are being used in the NCR with different efficacies, different dose intervals, that we do not really know the precise effect of vaccinations on the local pandemic. And this is a challenge if you're trying, again, to be as precise uh, in your forecast as possible. However, we can simulate the spread of Delta in the NCR because it, because it is likely that our experience of the surge will fall somewhere within the range of this Delta surges of Malaysia, Thailand, and in Vietnam. Why is that? They have varying vaccination rates. They have varying um, ratios of the different variants. They have, but they have very similar people to us biologically. They also have similar demographics. They have very similar responses to the different, um, to the challenge of the pandemic. And so uh, the, 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 the presupposition here is that our experience is going to be somewhere uh, like, it's going to be like one of these ASEAN countries. And so we got, and, and what we noticed, however, is that regardless of the precise ASEAN scenario, whether we looked at Thailand, Vietnam, or Malaysia, all of our scenarios predicted that our hospitals in the NCR would exceed critical capacity by the middle to end of August. This is why Okta last week, uh, or nearly 10 days ago, called for a circuit breaker lockdown. Now, what is actually happening? Well, we now have the experience of, of, of many days of data, and you can see there is a gradual and rising, quite dramatic, actually, rise in cases reported by our hospitals. And what's really interesting is I'm, I'm now comparing our projections with the actual hospital occupancy. So these are projections made on July 28th, and based on the Delta surges in Malaysia, Vietnam, and Thailand, we're expecting basically around 4,600 or so. And the actual hospital occupancy as of August 6th, based on DOH data, is actually 5,146. So it's a little bit higher than we had anticipated. And um, so I, I highlight that 
you know, despite those who had called us alarmists uh, two weeks ago, the Delta surge apparently is worse than the, what our projections had anticipated. Now, so it looks again that our model, though crude, and I have to admit that we're using very crude models because last year I had used a very cutting edge model from MIT and the, the MIT models with, with machine learning struggled with the limitations and shortcomings of the DOH data. And so I concluded that a simpler model that is useful in the Philippines is, is better than a more sophisticated model that might be less useful. Now, I have been asked recently, you know, some have asked me if our Okta model or the model that I have developed for hospital util utilization is uh, better or worse than DOH model. And I think this is the wrong question to ask. Instead, we have to ask, are both our models useful? Are they useful? Have they been useful? And I am grateful and I am going to publicly thank the DOH faster modelers uh, because their data, which was reported a few days after ours, in fact corroborated our findings that the surge would overwhelm our hospitals. And it is their data that was able to convince the IATF that it was so important for us to enter into a lockdown. And I want to reaffirm once again that the DOH modelers and the Okta modelers, we are working together as Filipino scientists to serve our country against a common enemy. And the common enemy is COVID-19. And so I think it's wrong to talk about whether our model or their model is better or worse. Both our models are useful. Both our models should be used to inform public policy. And for the most part, we're looking at trends. And I believe that both our models see the same trends um, and the same overall shape of the pandemic and I'm so grateful for the Fat to the Faster team for their, uh, for their work. So thank you very much for your kind attention. I hope to be able to return to these, these fireside chats later in order to answer any questions. Thank you very much and God bless you. Thank you, Father Nick Ostriaco. We hope to see you in a while. And um, our next speaker will be Dr. Professor Regina Berba. Dr. Berba, please. Good morning, everybody. Uh, let me share my slides. Wait lang. Wait lang po. Wait lang, sorry. Okay. Um, so first of all, uh, thank you very much for having me here. Thank you, Mike, for inviting me. Uh, I'm not very, very hardcore in the Okta research group. Hindi ako makasabay sa fast pace of uh, how our modelers are doing the modeling. Uh, someday I'd like to be a modeler too. So. Um, Idols ko po si Sir Guido at si Sir Ranjit at si Father at si Mike and everybody else in the team. Uh, pero correct ko po si Mike. Ah. So sabi niya kanina, dalawa yung anak kong sumakong laude. Actually, ang correction po dun ay tatlo ang anak kong sumakong laude. So I'm a really proud mom. Uh, two, two of my children graduated from UP and they're both summa cum laude and one graduated from Ateneo and was a summa cum laude. So anyway, uh, I'll stay within my turf. Okay, I'm an infectious disease uh, specialist and I'll be talking about the Delta variant and uh, some new studies uh, about increased transmissibility and vaccine effectiveness. So um, since the past has uh, done a lot of fora already, I would like just uh, concentrate on the discussion of very recent releases of studies on the Delta variant, uh, particularly the China studies, the Massachusetts experience, the uh, studies from the Public Health England, and share with you our recent PGH experience with the Delta variant. So um, from China, there was this well-traced outbreak that came out just a few weeks ago by the group of Dr. Lee et al. 
So what they did was to trace very, very comprehensively the very first local Delta infection in Guangdong, China. So it was uh, detected on May 21. Tapos ang ginawa nila was to really track every contact and quarantine immediately and swab the persons in the, in the quarantine facility uh, almost every day. So that was the protocol. And it was allowed by their ethics board review. And um, that uh, experience ended on June 18. The uh, cluster ended in June 18. And they detected 167 cases of Delta variants that all could be traced from the index case. So it was a really very grand design and it was so well implemented. And because of that, we now know more about how the Delta variant transmits in a very fast um, uh, mode. So um, they described the 2021 Delta, how, how the incubation period and the occurrence of the positive RT-PCR tests emanated from their quarantine patients. And then they this compare this with uh, some of their data from 2020. Yun sabi, original Wuhan uh, COVID. No? And you would see here that the uh, time to positivity from the exposure actually became shorter. So in 2020, what we're used to knowing is that um, the usual peaks of positivity from exposure is 5.61 days. Here, the average mean was six days in 2020. But lo and behold, now in 2021, with this uh, first case of Delta variant in China, they've seen that the positivity, the interval to positivity was much shorter. It was an average of four days and peaks at 3.71 days. They also looked at the CT values. So CT is cycle threshold. It's, a, it's a, one of the indicators we look for when we do PCR testing. And cycle threshold or CT refers to the number of cycles that we need, that the machine has to undergo to, to amplify the virus and detect, and detect it. And so the machine can read it. So when you think about it, the um, lower the value of the CT, the less the threat, the less the cycles that the machine has to do, um, that means the viral, the viral burden is probably higher. And in this graph that came from that China study, you would see the marked um, difference between the um, range of cycle thresholds for 2021 of the Delta variants compared to their 2020 data. So it seems to tell us that the viral burden of patients who were tested for the 2021 part compared to the 2020 was much higher. No? So the amount of virus present in the samples that were tested were much higher. And because of this, um, they hypothesized, and this is a model, they looked at um, the viral growth within each host and saw that the, or modeled or forecasted that um, the rate of increase in the amount of virus present within each host, which within each patient, uh, happened very fast. So that it's by the time it's detected on a positive PCR test, uh, the numbers are already very high. So maybe because of this, it's like evidence why um, why there is a potential for higher viral burden rate and why the transmissibility is much higher. And it suggests that the infectiousness of the Delta variant happens very early in the part of the infection. No? 
And um, knowing all of this is actually very crucial when we start thinking about how we can improve public health um, um, control. So the implications of all of this uh, information, new information to China was that um, they again strengthened their interventions to break the chain of transmission and um, their um, non-pharmaceutical uh, strategies were intensified. Um, it seems to suggest that um, uh, the people were probably most infectious. Medyo alam naman natin yun, di ba? When the person at the day of the onset of symptoms, that's when they are most infectious. But there's been, been more studies showing that you period just around the time that this person starts getting the symptoms, mga one or two days, maybe they are more infectious during that time. The frequency of uh, population screening had to be in optimized. That was one of the recommendations of the study. And how did that translate to action from the Chinese government? So um, they said, it was reported that over 30 million PCR tests were actually done, trying to really locate all this new Delta variants in China over a very brief period of time. The 30 million tests happened in, in, in this report just over a 14 day period. So Siguro, that's, that's the action that we need to do, not to really intensify, use the data, translate what has been seen in research and translate them to action. Okay. Um, the other the other public health policies that were affected also um, came from some of these recent reports. Um, as you saw, that our uh, this Chinese uh, data set showed the. the time window from exposure to the positive test actually shortened markedly from the initial of about five to six days down to three, three to four days. And because of this, the translation to public policy was in China, um, they required people who, are, who were leaving the city through airports, train stations, and bus stations, they report that they require them to have a negative COVID-19 test. So, um, ano yan eh? Uh, ano nga ba tawag dyan? Sa PGH na yan, may ganyan eh. For you to be admitted, you need a negative uh, PCR test. And they would say, gano'ng katagal yung uh, pwede na, I can't recall the exact term, pero how long is it is the test uh, usable? And in 2020, that range was actually seven days because the, the period was somewhere between five to seven days. But now, recently, the Chinese government reduced that um, period to three days. And more recently, they reduced that to two days. So kasi nga, you need to catch people. They can turn positive very quickly, even on... Um, some exposures. So there's also one of the important recent findings also is that the infectiousness seems to be highest early on. Medyo, as I said, alam na natin to before, but the data was never uh, stronger as it appeared recently in this particular Chinese study by Dr. Hu et al that came out in March, 2021. So they said that the um, infectiousness peak actually was somewhere between one to two days or 1.8 days before the symptom onset. So kailangan isipin natin yun, no? And that's part of the equation when we're doing some uh, strategies to control transmission. Um, and uh, they also saw that uh, the susceptibility increases with age and the transmissibility probably didn't differ between age groups and between symptomatic and asymptomatic persons. No? So some people would say, oh, asymptomatic siya, hindi na yan masyadong nakakahawa. But this group actually showed that that matters. No? 
and uh, definitely contacts of households and uh, exposures to first generation cases were at higher odds for transmission. And yun nga, yung children, even if most of them will be uh, mild in presentation, they can actually also be part of the transmission chain. So they're part of control measures. So, so this uh, second Chinese study had a lot of uh, samples of uh, how they did intensive contact tracing. So maybe that's something we could adopt in our country also. Okay, because of these two Chinese studies, um, the WHO actually had a stronger recommendation about uh, how long the quarantine period would be. So, yun nga, uh, pinakita nung studies na parang mas maiksi yung period from, yung tawag na tawag na incubation period, no? from the time of exposure to the time of uh, first symptoms. But does the Delta variant stay with us longer or is the incubation period longer? So the 14-day quarantine needs to be changed. So this next, I think, six slides are lifted from a WHO lecture. Diko na to chinage kasi perfect na yung pagkakagawa niya. So the data that they use to answer that question actually is uh, lifted, also lifted from the two China uh, studies that I cited earlier from China. And you would see that um, based on the evidence, there's no longer incubation period. In fact, naging shorter, hindi siya longer. So hindi kailangan mas matagal yung mga tao sa quarantine facilities. There's no need to change even if we say Delta variant siguro maraming cases sa ating community, there's no need to change the current quarantine period of 14 days. The other question is, if we're assuming many of our cases are now Delta without the benefit of a whole genome sequencing, should we prolong isolation period of the positive cases? Kasi baka pag-release mo sa kanila, mas makakahawa pa sila. But then again, the WHO said there's no change in recommendations based on current evidence. So we haven't seen in the data from China and they also included data from Korea that they haven't seen that the uh, infectiousness is longer, uh, stays longer in the body. So the previous uh, recommendations on when to discharge patients remain the same. So pag mild, usually mild to moderate 10 days, pag uh, severe and critical 21 days. Okay, so there's not enough available data to make any change with the uh, infectiousness of positive patients. This, this matters kasi diba, we're clearing to persons to go back to community, back to work. So this question is a very important question. Okay, so I said I was going to quote other um, or cite other studies that came out recently. So this came out just very recently from the United States. And this is a narrative of the breakthrough infections that happened in the Massachusetts uh, state uh, recently. So what happened was uh, there was multiple large events no, that happened in that county. In that um, at that point, they already have parang what we call herd immunity. They already have a vaccination coverage of 69%. Yet, many persons actually had symptoms and were eventually tested to be positive for COVID-19, 469. And of them, 74% were actually fully vaccinated. So, um, and... Among this, um, Delta variant was identified in 133 patients. So this is how their um, epidemic curve looked like. Okay, so there was really an outbreak. There were a lot of persons that were infected over a short period of time. Um, and these were all traced to um, dense uh, events that happened both indoor and outdoor. They said maybe in restaurants, in bars, in some 
resorts, in some hostels. So because of this experience, um, they were able to describe better what the uh, um, how breakthrough infections. So breakthrough infections are infections that would happen among fully vaccinated individuals. That means this person's already received the second dose and already passed over the two weeks after the second dose. So yun yung breakthrough infections. They still develop COVID-19 despite uh, having a fully um, vaccinated status. Um, the median age was 42. Most were male because most of the events actually doubt invited male participants. Uh, the vaccines that they received were Pfizer, Moderna, and Janssen. And um, in the bullet down below, you would see that the signs and symptoms were like what we usually associate COVID-19 to be cough, headache, sore throat, myalgia, and fever. Uh, among this, very few were actually uh, hospitalized and there were no deaths. So um, the, here they showed that there was no difference in the city values between unvaccinated and fully vaccinated. So your viral burden we think is probably the same as vaccinated ka o hindi. But because of this experience, there were again implications to the public health of the US through the CDC. And remember after their um, vaccination and most many states achieving the high coverage for vaccination, um, the CDC actually at some point recommended or agreed that uh, masking could be deferred. But uh, because of this uh, experience with Massachusetts, um, they uh, now are imposing that uh, in high-risk indoor um, activities that masking should be done regardless of vaccination status. Okay, so yung next na usual tanong. So um, will the COVID vaccines, uh, in light of this uh, Delta cases, would the COVID vaccines still work? Uh, so this uh, actually came out a few weeks ago. The study from the New England Journal of Medicine uh, led by uh, the group of Dr. Bernal and et al. So what they did was to have a test negative design. This is from the England Public Health England uh, database. And um, here you would see that, um, tingnan muna natin yung dose two. Ah. Look muna at dose two. So whether they receive the BNT 162B2 or the Pfizer or the Chad Oxford or the AstraZeneca. So those, those are the scientific names of these uh, vaccines. Um, after those two, the, the vaccine effectiveness was high, much higher than after just those one. Okay. And they were both in acceptable ranges, whether for Delta, which is the purple um, squares, and versus the alpha variant. So if we wanted to look at the actual numbers, the vaccine effectiveness against symptomatic disease, as reported by this group, was actually really acceptable. Uh, after those two, 79% uh, with that confidence interval. Okay. So what's their conclusion? So they said that overall, the high levels of vaccine effectiveness against symptomatic disease with the variant, Delta variant, after two doses of either the Pfizer or the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, there's a reduced effectiveness if we only get the first dose. So um, public health-wise, it's important that we really push all our citizens to get and finish the second dose of whatever vaccine they will receive to achieve the protection we like to have. 
the New England Journal article did not look at hospitalization. So because at that point they said it was one of the limitations of their data and they couldn't make any uh, estimates yet of vaccine effectiveness against hospitalization. But later on, when the Public Health England database was able to uh, gather more data, they were able to describe vaccine effectiveness against hospitalization. And again, actually, the numbers are even higher. So after those two, the vaccine effectiveness was estimated to be 96% with a very high confidence interval against Delta variant and also against the Alpha variant. So um, here I just inserted here because there's data in that particular report on Alpha variant because we still see a lot of Alpha variants so far based on the gen genomic the uh, results of the PGC that they give to us. So we are comforted with this particular uh, data set telling us that for many of the outcomes that are important to us, including mortality, hospitalization, um, symptomatic disease, then the uh, um, VE or vaccine effectiveness is very good for both the Pfizer and the AstraZeneca vaccines for the alpha variant. So share ko po at last na, maybe just two minutes. We had uh, really our own experience with the Delta variants at the PGH. No? So as you know, we're a referral hospital. The Philippine General Hospital is a referral hospital. So just over like less than six weeks, we've seen the doubling of our cases admitted at the Philippine General Hospital. So from about 90 per 90 at any 90 patients in July 2, there's now more than 180 patients admitted as of today. So um, as of July 31, we were actually informed by our Department of Health that we some of the samples we sent actually tested positive for the Delta variant. And these were patients who were with us from June 24 to July 17. So they were there already, even before we saw the rise in the number of cases. So the patients came from um, these parts of NCR, of Region 3 and Region 4. And we tried to describe, retrospectively go back to the cases and make sure they were okay and we tried to describe them according to this characteristic. So uh, we saw them, the 21 cases, eight were actually admitted to the PGH, eight were, were patients in our outpatient swab facility, and five were healthcare workers. And in this chart, we also tried to further describe their vaccination status. So most of our patients, young patient patients, were unvaccinated or not fully vaccinated, but all of our healthcare workers were vaccinated. So um, you would see that uh, in the category of COVID-19, according to the severity of their illness, the severe and critical cases were all not fully vaccinated. They were actually unvaccinated and one was had just one dose. And um, the, in the outcomes, we had two deaths in the 21, among the 21 cases, and one was unvaccinated and one received only one dose. Everybody else survived. So what I wanted to share with you is that, um, uh, as reported by other countries, the transmissibility in family or household contacts were very high. So. Uh, in these patients, they almost reported lahat na infect sa, sa aking pamilya. But in contrast, we had very limited transmission in the hospital. So remember, when we experienced these Delta cases, the exposures were actually, parang we, were, we were not informed that they were Delta. You would not know that they were Delta. The information that they were 
that they are Delta cases would come very much later. And actually some of the patients were also already discharged. But nevertheless, I think what I'd like to tell you in the audience is that even if we see this Delta face to face, and this is what is encountered by the frontliners, if we take extra effort to really take care of ourselves and protect ourselves according to protocol, then the risk for outbreaks in the health facility will probably be very low. So we try to, as much as possible, contact, follow, and test every contact of all these Delta exposures we had. And only two tested positive among 308 contacts or just a very, very low of 0.6%. And one of them was an unvac is an unvaccinated staff. So parang I didn't want to leave you uh, feeling really, really very afraid and anxious about what's to come. I think the message is that if we are able to have some control of our own situations in ourselves, in our households, in our workplaces, we should be able to manage and really control the transmissibility of this highly infectious and transmissible variant of the COVID-19. We also uh, ident um, determine the cycle thresholds of our confirmed Delta cases. So you would see here that they're really, really low, so high viral burdens. But again, may selection bias dito eh, kasi um, the way it works is um, if the cycle threshold is uh, low, that's the only time they will be sent or allowed or processed by the Philippine Genome Center. So may selection bias na kaagad. And we don't have a comparison yet with the non-confirmed Delta cases. So abangan na lang ang future data related to this. So, so here we uh, really want to just share with you that despite the high transmissibility, it's perhaps possible to transform many of our uh, workplaces, households, government places to be able to control the transmission of this difficult um, variant. Uh, and as a last slide, actually, we're doing the real world vaccine effectiveness as what we call the Philippine VE project. So it's something that I will be um, updating you in the future months. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Berba. We now request uh, Dr. Benjamin Vallejo for his presentation. Okay, uh, so uh, good morning and good evening to our, our colleagues in the other side of the world, in the United States and Canada. Uh, I will present on... Uh, or what are the possible strategies in terms of uh, COVID-19 policy uh, we can do. Uh, I'm framing this in the sense of a more international effort because I am, uh, I unfortunately, well, whether it's fortunate or unfortunate, uh, I was uh, appointed to head the Philippines component of ESCAPE. And let me introduce what ESCAPE is. Uh, this is the evaluation of science advice in the pandemic emergency. Uh, which is an international uh, research program assessing the how science advice is given to governments in 17 uh, countries. So the Philippines is the 17th country in this program. I'm also a, a fellow of the International Network for Government Science Advice. Uh, I'm part of the Asia chapter, and we've been looking into policies for uh, for the management of uh, infectious diseases ever since uh, 2017. Now, uh, INSA is uh, transdisciplinary, so uh, different scientists from different disciplines are, are there to give their insights on important science and society issues. So COVID-19 is a major science and society issue we have now. So uh, I'll present on what COVID exit is. Okay, we, we we had a consensus 
calling it COVEXIT, being uh, inspired by Brexit. Okay? While uh, in Brexit, uh, the UK went out of the European Union for political and economic reasons. We have to get out of COVID-19 pandemic for our own sakes as a global, uh, as a global society. So can we really get out of COVID-19? That is the question now that faces scientists, medical doctors, and also people working in the science and policy and government uh, uh, sector of research and advice. Can we really get out of COVID-19? Now, uh, before I proceed, I I'd like to introduce uh, Escape, especially for our friends in the media and for some Paase uh, colleagues who are maybe are not yet familiar. Uh, Escape is a project, uh, international project, partially funded by the US NSF. Okay, there are 17 countries that I, I said were evaluating science advice in pandemic emergencies. And uh, for those who are interested, you can uh, log in to escapecovid19.org to find out more of what this research program is and its publications and links to other resources. And of course, it's very entertaining and, 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 well, and fact uh, field full of facts, blogs. We're in, you are linked to different resources, scientific resources on COVID-19. Also, similarly, the International Network for Government Science Advice has also a portal for COVID-19 uh, science and policy. So uh, for those who are interested, you can just log on to ingsa.org and look at all the resources and training materials for science advice in, for, for COVID-19. Now, the consensus for COVID-19 policy uh, now is this. I just outlined this in this slide. Though. Okay, the, the first things that countries had to decide in February of 2020 is whether to suppress or eliminate SARS-CoV-2, the virus that co causes COVID-19. And uh, when countries decided to do either of the two approaches, that was informed by the science that was present at around that time. Okay, I, I, was, I was looking at the evidence for COVID-19 at that time, and uh, I could say that uh, we really didn't know much about it. Okay. And that would inform what kind of policies, whether in, in, in treating patients or in public health, or in education, or in science research, what happens to how we are going to deal with COVID-19. Now, uh, just to give you a, a backgrounder, most countries adopted the suppression paradigm, or the suppression strategy. The vast majority of countries that were surveyed by INSA and ESCAPE uh, in terms of their policies, and also by the Oxford uh, COVID response policy tracker, the Oxford University project that uh, is parallel with this, most countries adopted the suppression policy, okay, which was translated for a lot of people as flattening the curve. A few countries, most notably China, South Korea, Taiwan, and New Zealand went the other way. Right from the start, they decided on an elimination policy. And I think Dr. Berba in the past press, you know, in the presentation just a while ago, stated the still the ongoing policy of China with its massive ma testing, 30 million people, I think in, in the Wuhan area, that is a key ingredient in an elimination policy. In a suppression policy, they would think, uh, okay, we'll put more weight on, on isolating people, but not really testing everyone, okay? So the Philippines, right from the start, we adopted, just like most countries in the world, a suppression policy. Now, fast forward to the present situation now, does the suppression or elimination policy, or which is better? Okay. Now, one of the indices for, possible, for our COVID exit or COVID exit is whether the infection rates are sustainable, the low infection rates. And I think Okta has done a lot of important uh, 
data analysis to say whether we are able to sustain low infection rates. No? The sustainability of low infection rates informed uh, the Chinese and even the Vietnamese response to the entry of the new variants that we have now, especially this Delta variant. Now, in countries where they were able to sustain the low infection rates, they were able to come up with so-called green and go zones in which there is mobility in, among the people to do their, their business. They can even go back to school with the proper health protocols. But of course, that policy was advised based on the low infection rates. Okay. With that, it's possible to reopen the economy, but how, how shall we do it? Reopening the schools, this is a key point in reopening the economy. Uh, I remember speaking to one of the economist consultants for one of the big banks in the country, here in the Philippines, saying that a large part of the economic growth rate is driven by consumption by young people, and that consumption is predicated if they are able to go to school. So maybe we need to open the schools. But of course, we need to have the, the health protocol still. I think the consensus globally is the health protocol should remain in place for the near foreseeable future, whether it's face mask or physical or social distancing, and of course, the importance of vaccination. Now, the general consensus now among science advisors on COVID-19 is for COVID exit to be realistic, there should be a shift from suppression or the flattening to curve to elimination. But of course, uh, given uh, science advisors are very much uh, cognizant or they realize the political and economic uh, consequences and the realities behind suggesting such uh, an approach. So this has to be taken into consideration if we're going if we really, if global society wants to go on a COVID exit route. And if you're following the news in, of different governments in how they approach it, we can see that some governments are still hesitant, even governments in the industrialized countries in the OECD. Okay? So, so that's the reality really, if we're going to go into so-called COVID so exit. But the realities are this. First, there is a need to sustain the R0, okay, which has been uh, well discussed by uh, my colleague Guido. Okay? And the World Health Organization has recommended it should be sustained at less than 0.5. Okay? And the positivity rate at less than 5%. Now, there are some countries that have rec recommended, especially some countries in the European Union, that the sustainability of these low infection rates should be at least for three months which would allow for increased mobility and economic reopening in the so-called green and go zones. However, this increased mobility and economic reopening would require stricter border controls and health checks. Now, this is a politically hot potato in, the whole, in, in, this, whole, in this whole idea because some people have now uh, COVID-19 lockdown fatigue. So adding another burden that is stricter to what they are used to may not be politically popular. <laughs> and also there's a need for immediate lockdowns or so-called trigger lockdowns. If the indices for epidemiological indices exceed what has been decided by a government as the threshold, then that would require an immediate trigger lockdown. Okay? However, these trigger lockdowns are expected to expect that they have to be of shorter durations, but harder, okay? And this is what some people are having quite difficulty in accept, accepting, okay? Harder, but shorter lockdowns. And it could be, it could be in, in series, okay? It might, your economy might reopen for a few weeks then lockdown again, okay? So, but that is uh, one of the things that have been uh, pushed by advisors that may be needed because over time, as the virus is eliminated, well, in a relative sense, because I think the consensus is the virus will still be there. Uh, if it's uh, more or less eliminated as a nuisance to our economic life, then there will be less need for lockdowns, maybe, or even areas in which the lockdowns will be in, in smaller geographical areas. So those are the 
what the COVID exit reality could possibly be. Of course, I think a lot of people are already uh, quite familiar about this, including my colleagues in Okta, uh, and also with the uh, International Network for Government Science Advice. Okay, there's a need for increased vaccination rate. Some estimates would say it's about 60% or more of the population and contact tracing as much as possible and immediate isolation of infected people to prevent cluster infections at the smallest geographical scale. I believe one of our officials in the government termed this as, called this as tiny bubbles. Okay, whether it's a tiny bubble or a big bubble, there is still a need to immediately isolate infected people to prevent cluster infections. Now, uh, I think that our, our speakers today have brought in or brought out all the, le the recent evidence from epidemiological modeling, clinical studies, and public health studies about the Delta variant. Okay? So I don't need to... Uh, to repeat it here. <laughs> now, I think Dr. Ver Ver Verba has told us that there are shorter infection times, okay? And there's a possibility of more infectious infections, uh, sorry. And also there's a possibility of more uh, of, of the Delta variant being more infective than the past uh, variants that we had. And also there is already some estimates on the risk of people that have been vaccinated getting it and whether they're going to get, uh, they have to get admitted to hospitals or not. Apparently the evidence suggests that the vaccinated people, if ever they catch it, would need not to go to hospital and their cases could be managed outside the hospital. And their chances are they would experience only mild uh, symptoms. However, how disruptive is the Delta variant because the Delta variant would probably require more short term but hard lockdowns. And I think we're seeing this in places in China and in Vietnam. How economically and politically disruptive are these? These are important policy questions that needed that need to be addressed. Now, uh, okay. Uh, I also take, I take this opportunity also to introduce everyone to the importance of what we call independent science. Okay? Because independent science uh, provides for open and transparent review of data and scientific conclusions or theories with respect to, to an issue of science and society, okay? in this case, COVID-19. Now, Paase is, is Paase as an organization is part of the independent science community. Why am I saying this? Because Paase doesn't get, doesn't get uh, public money and its, member, and its colleague, members, <laughs> my colleagues in Paase, don't get paid for, be, for doing work with Paase. So Paase is essentially uh, a group of uh, scientists and experts who are giving their time without pay. So essentially it's independent science. Now, independent science uh, are, are one of the modalities to give science advice in crisis because they can provide for rapid and open and technical and transparent review of scientific evidence generated whether by acad academe or by government science institutions or health departments or ministries worldwide. Independent science is not part of the government or it's not the government institution. It's not even part of a formally part of academic institutions. And scientists who are in independent science may, may be part of the academe as part of their day jobs. For instance, uh, my work in escape is independent science because I don't receive any, any dollar in compensation for escape. And uh, it complements my work as an academic in UP, but UP doesn't give me a TOR or appointment to work, work in escape. And, uh, and that is just uh, part of the side that I have to do, uh, aside from my day job, which is to teach, uh, which I have to do in a little while. <laughs> now, uh, members in, in OCTA are also 
part of the so-called independent science community because they don't get a single peso. And I have to emphasize this, they don't get a single peso from doing OCTA work. And the OCTA is not a government institution, it's independent. And, and OCTA people are just doing their volunteer jobs aside from their day jobs. So independent science is, is really citizen science. The scientists who are in independent science work are unpaid volunteers. However, they function an important, uh, they do an important function. They place scientific facts and debate in the public domain in the interest of openness and transparency and the standards of good science for better understanding and better decision making. So see, independent science now has a very important role in the COVID-19 pandemic as acting as extended reviewers of scientific evidence. In most cases, the review crosses disciplines because that's the new paradigm now. It has to cross disciplines really as COVID-19 is a multifactorial problem. It's a, it's a problem that has its economic, social, it's obviously the medical aspects and public health and, and, and political context. So what we do in the independent science community, for example, uh, since my trainer uh, in this is Sir Peter Glackman, who is a well-renowned uh, researcher in pediatrics, uh, and he heads the New Zealand uh, Science Advice uh, Committee. Uh, they consult with so-called independent panels or scientists to come up with uh, recommendations. And the latest recommendation to the New Zealand government is this on the screen, uh, COVID-19, make it the last pandemic in which uh, in the report, they synthesize all the evidence that we have done globally and how it could be applied in the New Zealand uh, social and political context. And we also did one for Switzerland in which uh, the story is similar to what's happening now, that a parliamentary investigation on independent science was uh, much criticized by the, the Swiss community and the Swiss public leading to the parliament withdrawing any, any parliamentary investigation on the credibility of scientists in Switzerland in the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, for the reasons that the parliament is not the right venue for discussing the merits of scientific work. So it has to be left to science academies and, uh, and the science community as a whole. So uh, I think that's about it. Uh, a quick rundown on, on what the global consensus now and the importance of independent science in coming up with a global consensus on uh, getting out of COVID-19. That is what we have to look into, getting out of COVID-19. So again, uh, thank you. And uh, thank you to Paase for giving me the opportunity to talk to you. And also for the Octa colleagues for providing me the right data and evidence context to relate this to, uh, to the framework that we have now for escape. So thank you again and good day. Thank you, Professor Vallejo. And thank you to my colleagues in uh, Okta for your presentation. We now open the floor to questions from our audience. Let me start with the question here. Is it possible? Maybe this is for Dr. Berba. Is it possible to be infected by two variants at the same time? Um, I, I think, uh, parang when you think about it, maybe it's a possibility, but it based on most experts' uh, uh, hypothesis, parang it probably won't happen. Yeah. Because at some point you develop some antibodies at the start of the, uh, of the uh, infection. So uh, there's some protection already about getting other 
variants. Kunyari, may alpha ka na, may beta ka pa, tas may delta ka pa. Lahat dito sa lalamunan mo. Maybe, when you think about it, maybe pwede, pero it probably won't happen. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Berba. Dr. Dairit has a comment and a question. Dr. Dairit, please uh, unmute yourself. Yeah, uh, hi. Well, first of all, uh, I think thank our, uh, all of our really uh, great experts at, um, for sharing their, their insights. Um, I think it's a very special opportunity. Uh, I'm not sure which question you had in mind, but I just posted actually a, um, just a recent question. Uh, they talk about the transition, you know, possible transition from a pandemic to an epidemic. Now, I'm not sure what this means when it, we're talking about COVID-19. Um, can anyone you know, um, you know, give, provide this an answer? What does it mean when they say that COVID-19 may become from a pandemic to an epidemic? And congratulations to everyone. Thank you. Uh, anyone to answer that? Uh, Dr. Balejo, please. Maybe you have the answer. Mike, siguro ako sa sagot. Yeah, so, yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Um, sir, I think, <laughs> sir, I think ang question yung pandemic to an endemic illness or an endemic infection, ibig sabihin, parang nandito na siya, just like uh, influenza, like it will keep on like mutating, pero... Uh, we get vaccines every year. Parang ganun na, yung, gan, ganun na yung nakikita ng many experts that what will happen, it won't, and then it will just naturally decay and then it will go away. Parang ganun. Um, yun po yung ibig sabihin, it, will, it might stay with us and then magiging low viral burdens as it will not cause significant disease anymore. Parang maybe that's the future. That's a parang more plausible future of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah, so, yeah, so I, I guess, yeah, I guess your follow-up question, would this be due to the vaccines or, would it, would, or maybe a combination of natural you know, immunity that people eventually develop? Um, maybe yes, sir. A combination of many factors, the vaccination and then a huge number of <clears throat> persons will already have developed uh, sufficient immunity based on natural infection. So, siguro po ganun. At saka nag, parang nag-mutate tapos nag-die down na yung virus along the way. We hope it will mutate in a, into a form that... Uh, it will get ex extinguished on its own. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dairit and Dr. Berba. Thank you. Red Mendoza raised his hand. Uh, Red, Red is from the Manila Times. Hi, po. Good morning, po. Uh, doc, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Duke, uh, doc, uh, doc Ido, doc, um, doc Benjamin, and uh, uh, Father Nika. And Doc Berba, uh, Doc Regina, um, question lang po on the uh, on the infections sa mga bata. Um, do lipos nga po na medyo tumataas na po yung infections natin sa mga bata right now because of the Delta variant. Um, being an infectious disease specialist po, ma'am, is it imperative na po ba to do pediatric vaccinations na po ba to protect kids against the Delta variant po? Uh, the, it's in the pipeline naman po talaga. And eventually, I think we will be immunizing the children also. Except we're really also waiting for safety data. So the vaccines really need to, you know, beyond reasonable doubt, makita natin and all be convinced that the the safety profiles of all the uh, vaccines that will be approved here and globally will be safe for the kids, yeah, for the children less than 18 years old. Professor Jomar Rabahante would like to ask a question. Jomar? Okay, hello po. Magandang araw po sa ating lahat. Um, 
Mabilis lang naman po yung comment ko, although nagsulat na ako ng script para hindi lumampas. Um, I respect po all the Octa researchers. Sir Guido was my uh, former professor and I respect all the members of Octa. Um, my comment is actually not about the personalities, but probably a recommendation for the full Octa group. And uh, my comment is also not about the other issues about Octa. We know there are other issues uh, other than the COVID-19 modeling. Personally, I don't have problem with Okta telling um, uh, the COVID-19 situation in the Philippines in the media. Actually, I'm very thankful because uh, they provide uh, a wider uh, venue for, the, for a wider audience na marinig kung ano ang COVID-19 situation in the Philippines. Um, there are also other groups, FASTER, who is, who, uh, which is the official modeler of the government. But of course, the researchers then, there, the scientists, they have NDA, so they cannot talk to the media. UP COVID-19 COVID pandemic response team is also here. Um, sometimes uh, they are invited by the media, but currently most of the researchers in UP are uh, focused on uh, LGUs and institutions. So you see, Okta here is uh, playing a big role to to somehow share their expertise in to a wider audience. So I have three points po sana to, to raise. Um, the first one is about, again, about media. Second one is about accountability. And the third one is about transparency. The first one is about media. Um, sadly, I see many media argument exchanges that I believe, or possibly on my personal side, have negative effect on the modeling and data analytics community, especially on, you know, on if we, if we look at the Philippines where people are not that much uh, mature in terms of what science is. So thanks to Paase for having this kind of conversation. Um, also, uh, I heard uh, the presentation of Father Nick and I'm thankful because uh, he changed his tone uh, with respect to the government commissioned modelers because uh, he, release an opinion article in Rappler, which somehow when, when, when we are going to read that, that, that provides some negative impression to the uh, faster group. And, uh, and thankfully, uh, Father Nick said, we need to be uni united against COVID-19. Hindi magkakaaway ang mga modelers. Actually, we are one whole family and we need to take care of each other. Sadly, may gantong nangyayari. And uh, I hope also Dr. Edsel is here, but uh, I believe he's not here, no? The second one is about accountability. Um, for the Okta group, who is accountable? Uh, who reviews their research? Um, it may not be published, but who uh, reviews their research? And uh, if ever there will be somehow wrong uh, pronouncements in the media, who retracts the statements? Because there are certain uh, news articles out there saying that uh, there are miscalculations. First is with Baguio. I, I believe Dr. Donna is here. Uh, the UP Baguio and the uh, Baguio City talked to Okta about their miscalculations about the Baguio situation in 2020. The second one is about the Tagig uh, hospitalization rate. So na, there are also miscalculations. The third one is the case fatality rate in Manila. Uh, last March, there are miscalculations and DOH clarified that. And the fourth one is um, the uh, announced or the recommendation of Father Nick about 90% of the vaccine allocation should be in NCR. But currently we see that there are many highly urbanized cities in the provinces that are affected by COVID-19. So what I'm saying here is who uh, or what, what, what's the system of OCTA in terms of retraction or in terms of being accountable? I believe no data is perfect, but we should also know the limitations of data sets. DOH data drop has uh, limitations, uh, but I believe we, uh, Okta should also look at a more granular real-time data from LGU. So if they're going to present something about an LGU, probably it's good for them to talk, uh, to, talk to the LD, LGUs. The third one is uh, transparency of models. Um, uh, why not make the models, the methods public? I, I believe we, uh, some of the research, researchers there in Okta saying you can email us, but why not make it just public? Because sometimes it's really very hard for scientists to, to ask uh, for their copies pa using email. Why not make it public uh, for transparency? Um, while models are not perfect, and as uh, Dr. Uh, Father Nick said, some are useful, but some are some, some also can harm. Uh, nandun, nandun yan sa ano sa sa article ni Father Nick sa Rappler. 
uh, idadagdag ko lang, while all models are wrong, but there are certain good practices that should be followed. And that's why we need to scrutinize the methods. So transparency and methods and data sources, of course, following data privacy law, they are essential. Personally, ako, personally, I'm curious about the methods of Father Nick, why he recommended 90% vaccine allocation to NCR. Okay. Um, what? Thank you, Jomar. Let, yes, yes. let Sir, us uh, allow uh, Guido David to answer some of your concerns. You know, yeah. comment later. Okay. Yes. Sa <laughs> ano, uh, yung uh, policy aspect, natanong na kasi ni Jomar. Eh. So, yes, uh, thank you. So marami yung questions, so I'm not sure ano, if I even remember all of them and some of them will be addressed by some of my colleagues as far far as um sige, i'll uh, answer the the easier ones first young father nick's um, presentation on the uh, vaccine model uh, that was his model by the way uh, we presented a uh, another model based on risk so it was a you know even in, within the octa research group we conduct peer review uh, among uh, amongst ourselves. So the 90% was presented in one of our media forums, um, in one of our, sorry, uh, Blueprint um, webinars. Um, you know, maybe we should invite more scientists there. And that's where we actually present uh, some of our uh, latest findings, which, um, you know, we try to be trans as transparent as possible. Um, regarding some of the, uh, no, regarding the modeling, uh, we have actually been peer reviewed by my own college, um, presented it uh, some time ago, but unfortunately, uh, Professor Raban Hante was invited, but um, he was not there uh, at that time. Um, some of the other members of the College of Science of UP were there uh, because they wanted to see the methodology. And we actually did a discussion and they asked questions. So it's completely transparent. You know, we don't publish it regularly, because the, you know, it will not be receiving the same level of appreciation by the, the media or the, the general public. I mean, uh, that's, what, that's why we have scientific uh, meetings, conferences, and webinars, because that's where we can discuss this uh, in front of our peers. So um, uh, I, I can say for a fact that it was presented and some of my um, colleagues in the Institute of Mathematics uh, from the College of Science have, in fact, looked at our own models in terms of just the model, and they have raised questions, in the, et cetera. Uh, about the data, uh, you know, you mentioned about the University of Baguio. When we look at national data, we don't have the time to look at granular data, you know, and it would not be fair because the aggregator of the all the data is the Department of Health. And this is the international standardized um, platform. If I want to look at the US data, I look at, you know, I go to the website, for example, in the United States or United Kingdom, I look at what their ministry or Department of Health would provide to me as the data. I will not have to, I mean, sometimes they have granular data on New York City, et cetera, New York State, New York City. So, um, you know, it would be uh, an inconvenience to, you know, look at specific data sets. So regarding the Baguio City, all we did was we published what was in the Department of Health. So we did not manufacture or fabricate our own data. So if there are issues with data accuracy, it should be addressed to the Department of Health, not us, because we just basically, you know, presented what was in the data drop. And sure, yes, there may be some mistakes, but this is an issue that should be taken up by the LGU with the Department of Health. Even the hospitalization that you mentioned for TAGIG, well, that is that was what was shown by the Department of Health. We don't have the resources to go to each LGU and say, hey, you know, uh, what's your hospitalization rate? Because, you know, Thank we you, do this. Know. Right, right. We I do this regularly. You have, uh, explained it well. Right, right. And, and just to add uh, regarding the, uh, no, um, yes, we want to work together, all modelers. Um, you know, we actually support the Ateneo Fasters, um, you know, th their findings. And it was, in fact, their own findings that um, helped us, gui help guide us 
in this uh, current search because it was the findings of the Atene Faster Group that was presented to the IATF and the national government that prompted this um, timely response to the uh, to the threat of a surge. So yeah, um, I'll you know uh, Dr. Mike. So maybe some others could chime in. So I answered all those that I you know could remember. Yeah, I'd like to call on uh, Dr. John Wong. He raised his hands. Dr. Wong. Hi, thank you, Dr. T. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I have a couple of questions now, but I'll, I'll try to be brief. I know a lot of people want to ask questions also. <clears throat> um, so the model data model is based on DOH data, and we know that DOH data has a lot of flaws now. Uh, but I think it's also incumbent on the modelers now to to own own up to the uh, to the flaws of the data no? and be transparent no? uh, when you when you <clears throat> communicate no? your models now. These are the biases. These are what percent of the data is missing, and so these are the uncertainties. No? Uh, and also, how did you how do you account for the biases to to, to reduce the uncertainty in the model? Um, second, I think it would also be good to report the uncertainty intervals or the confidence intervals around your estimates. No? Um, uh, it's part of the uh, good modeling practices no? that uh, we should practice. Um, uh, I also have a suggestion that uh, maybe it would be better to present the models or the estimates as projections no? rather than predictions. No? Uh, weather forecasts are predictions no? because uh, the physics around weather no, is very well understood. No? But uh, infectious disease modeling is about people. No? Uh, there are a lot of variations in social, uh, in social behavioral uh, factors no? that we cannot account for in models. So, for example, if you break down R, the basic reproduction number, it's uh, affected by the transmissibility rate, no? which is controlled by masking, the contact rate, which is controlled by social gathering and improved ventilation, and the duration of, of infectiousness, no? which is controlled by uh, early earlier testing. No? So it's better if we present it as what if scenarios. No? If you do this, then you can avoid this, no? rather than as things that will happen. That will that will happen for sure. You know? um, and then lastly, um, <clears throat> when George Box said that uh, mo all models are wrong, but some are useful, uh, it was actually a paradoxical statement. No? Uh, if you make a if you make a prediction and then you're right, no, then it wasn't useful, no, because policymakers, no, or people listening to you uh, did not change their behavior. Or they didn't, they didn't uh, institute the proper uh, policies no, uh, to avoid the worst case scenarios. Uh, however, if uh, the model is useful and people follow you, uh, people change policy, no, uh, then uh, you will result in a situation where your estimates would be wrong, and that would be actually be a better scenario. No? So, uh, so when I when I advise, for example, IETF, no, I would rather be wrong no, rather than right, because no? uh, that means that they did they did uh, uh, follow the warnings. No? Uh, and that maybe just a small note, no, na, that R, no, uh, it's not a it's not a measure of speed because uh, R is unitless. Eh, no, it doesn't have a speed denominator. No, um, Zoom format. It's, it's, a measure, it's actually a ratio no, of the ratio of uh, uh, infected to secondary cases. No? <laughs> Um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wong. In fact, we in Okta share your sentiments that uh, the projections and forecasts should be a warning so that people can change their behavior so that policies can be instituted and result to lower total number of cases and lower mortality among our people. So thank you for sharing that uh, sentiment with us too. I'd like to call on uh, Dr. Ernesto Pernia, who has raised his hand. Sir? Uh, th thank you, for, uh, uh, Dr. T, for uh, giving me this uh, space. Yeah, I, I, have, I have a question to the modelers. Uh, maybe uh, Dr. Guido, uh, 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 David would uh, be able to answer this. Uh, 
you know, there's this view that the COVID will be with us. And so we have to accept and imbibe this uh, idea. So people, I think, are becoming more cognizant of the possibility that the COVID will be with us, uh, you know, maybe in different forms. So my question is, uh, uh, are you, are, would you be able to model uh, how the Delta variant uh, can uh, bear another variant or can branch into another variant, maybe Epsilon? So uh, I think if uh, you're able to do that, then it's uh, really going to be useful because uh, authorities and people in general will be able to prepare for what is to come. But, uh, what the modeling that you have been doing is really looking at past data and uh, trying to explain what happened. So I wonder if there is a, there's a way of modeling forward in terms of uh, a, a variant like Delta uh, uh, bearing or you know being able to bear uh, a, another child, uh, which is a, a, another variant, Epsilon, or it can branch into another variant like Epsilon. Thank you. Yes, uh, I don't know where Dr. Michael T is, but thank you for the question, uh, Dr. Pernia. Uh, so, um, regarding your question, yes, uh, we believe that you know it's uh, you know it's possible to model a lot of natural phenomena in science in the natural sciences. Uh, I would admit that the modeling that uh, you are um, seeking, you know, this is a very uh, extensive uh, modeling that would require input from the molecular biologists and the biologists because. It has uh, a lot to do with the, you know, uh, genetic characteristics, the characteristics of the virus uh, itself. Um, I'm sure maybe if we have a large team, including, for example, uh, Dr. Joe Marabahante, you know, we could possibly look into this. Uh, but uh, of course, the threat is not just the the evolution of the variant itself. You know, you know, it, it's mutation because. Uh, it, here in the Philippines, you know, the, the uh, I mean, of course, I mean, just looking at it from the local setting in the Philippines, because most of the variants were actually imported to us. And uh, the only variant that we have produced so far is the, is the P3, um, the Theta variant, which, well, well I mean, it's a, it sounds like a mathematical name. But um, yeah, so uh, in terms of looking into the future, in terms of the uh, evolution of the the virus, you know, as a mathematical model, uh, you know, this is something that could probably be, be done. But you know, we we are also looking into, you know, um, more of the the shorter um, term uh, scenarios, or at least what what could happen, and, and that's why um, you know, uh, well, I mean, I, I I what I'm saying basically is that this would be a you know an interesting. Uh, academic study, you know, looking into the, the the mutation stuff, but but of course we know that the or at least what we think is that, you know, mutations occur more widely because of the prevalence of the virus, and the, as we begin to contain the spread of the pandemic with um, vaccinations and with more people, you know, getting natural immunity, then uh, the prevalence of the um, uh, this would of course affect the the uh, mutation of the virus as well as we limit the number of cases. So, um, and regarding uh, what uh, Dr. Wong mentioned a while ago, yes, the uh, reproduction number, of course, is a, is a ratio um, that's in, in fact in our papers. So uh, what we are looking at is the rate of infection, which is uh, one of the, um, I mean, uh, we just use the reproduction number in the common uh, discussion, but the rate of infection is uh, the numerator in this ratio, and this is actually what we're looking at. So, so in a way, we could see it as a strength, um, regardless of it's a ratio or a rate. It's, we could use it to indicate the strength of the pandemic in that, in the sense that if, if it's increasing, the pandemic is getting stronger, and if it's decreasing, it's getting weaker. So, thank you so much. 
Thank you. A any other modeler who may have an answer to what Dr. Pernia is asking? Maybe uh, Dr. Lagmay or Dr. Abahante? Yeah, I posted my answer. Sorry. Um, modeling the uh, formation of new variants is very difficult as this requires non normally distributed distribution and uh, usually heavy tailed. It's even the probability is very low. It's like forecasting when earthquake will, will arise. But uh, yeah, there are models out there, but it's very challenging. Yeah, thank you, Po. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wong, any take on this question? <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, uh, I think it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's difficult to model no, because not, not a lot of the variants have been very well studied. No? Uh, the UK has the most uh, information about variants. No? And, and unless or until a variant uh, reaches the UK and becomes predominant, we, we will have very li little information about its R or its transmissibility or its effect on hospitalizations and deaths. Thank you. Thank you. UNTV. Uh no, first, uh, I'd like to recognize uh, Professor Ranjit Rai, who is mainly responsible for gathering all the scientists who participated in many of the OCTA research uh, reports. Dr. Uh, Professor Rai, please. Yeah, uh, good morning to everyone. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank, uh, on behalf of OCTA, the PASE, um, and, and, and the scientists who are here gathered here today. Um, th this is an opportunity for us, uh, and we will take all these opportunities to talk with our scientific community <clears throat> and um, to uh, be more transparent and accountable as far as our um, methods and models are concerned, and, and, and to be open to be reviewed. And, and, and uh, this, is, it is in this light that I, I want to just uh, reaffirm the, uh, the comments of uh, Dr. Rabahante, who we, whose work we truly admire. And it's also part of this uh, broad movement no, to use science uh, in the service of uh, improving our response to COVID-19. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Rabahante, we agree with your position that uh, part of accountability is presenting uh, in forums like this, and we will continue to do so with PASE as a, as a regular uh, activity and with other scientific uh, uh, communities in the country. Number two, uh, with regards to Baguio, uh, uh, and, and the people in Baguio are here also, you know that we talked to you guys, and we coordinated with you guys, but really the struggle with Okta is we are using official data from the DOH. And we also know that in the past uh, year and a half that uh, there's a lag between what we see in the local governments, the almost real-time data in local governments and in the DOH. And, and we were mindful of that, and that's why we adjusted uh, all our own uh, 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 reports after that mindful that uh, we have other UP people also doing re uh, very good work in helping Baguio understand uh, the state of COVID-19 in their area. Number three, uh, John Wong, uh, Professor John Wong, whom we also tr uh, truly respect, uh, suggested we, uh, we, we, we uh, be even more accountable and transparent with regards to our technical data, and we shall, we shall do so. We're hearing it from the community. We will provide that in our website, in our FB page, uh, especially for those who are interested in the technical data, uh, including the, the methods. No? We, uh, we, we are doing what you're suggesting, uh, Dr. Wong, but we haven't been publishing it. Uh, we haven't been providing it in our website and in our FB page, which, were, which is now under construction. So uh, la lastly, and most importantly, uh, to, the, to the statement of uh, Dr. Rabahante, uh, yes, modular scientists, okay, doctors unite, uh, okay, this is our mantra in uh, Okta and our, 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 this is the sense of our community, uh, we're not against each other, we're working towards uh, providing illumination as far as the state of COVID-19 in the country and uh, while there is no unanimity because we, we're looking at the world from different models, uh, be assured that Okta is one, there is solidarity. Okay, in the idea that we are all working for our country uh, and we're all working uh, so that we can, uh, you know, uh, help craft a collective and better response against COVID-19. So this is just a reassurance I want to uh, let everyone know. Uh, the, the scientific community is a community where we belong and we are most comfortable with. Here we understand the ethics and values of, of, 
not just creating knowledge, but being truth tellers and truth seekers. And this is uh, the position we will keep and we will continue to engage our community and to be accountable and to be ready to be reviewed and, uh, and to improve no, on the comments and suggestions of our fellow scientists. Thank you and good morning. Dr. T, are you around? Yeah. Michael? Yes, I think the next person is Mahar Lagmai is raising his hand and, and maybe... Uh, yeah, uh, just... Yeah, thank, what's that, Ranjit? Ranjit, thank you. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, just, just a quick comment no? uh, in the perspective of disaster risk reduction. Um, nakakatuwa na... Na, hindi naman nakakatuwa na may pandemic, ano? but nakakatuwa na this was an opportunity for scientists' work no? and the, their discussions to be highlighted. No? I'd, I'd just like to comment also that the, the situation that we're having with all of the noise, quote-unquote quote, noise, is not unique to COVID-19. Neither is it unique to the Philippines. It happens all over the world and also happens for all types of hazards. What is important is that uh, media has helped us no, because of the discussions, ongoing discussions. The, it brought into the forefront discussions that are scientific rather than unscientific discussions. And uh, we also brought at the forefront the idea of openness and transparency which I think is very good for the growth of the science of disaster risk reduction. Um, maganda po at natutuwa ako and thank you very much for, for Paase for doing this and to, to media as well no? for, for bringing the scientific discussions to the attention of everybody. Yun lang po. Thank you. Thank you, Mahar. Dr. Lagmay. It looks like uh, Dr. Michael T has some other meeting to attend. So um, I would like to um, read the question of Dr. Ben Dofitas. Question of modeling. Have you generated a model wherein a hypothetical effective early treatment of COVID infection is factored in? Assuming all pre-symptomatic and symptomatic cases are treated early with an effective antiviral. How fast will this exit strategy take effect? Yes, uh, Dr. Gisela, I'll take that, uh, that question. Um, uh, early treatment would actually translate to um, an effective contact tracing strategy because that ties into early treatment in, or in fact, uh, because what we're looking at, of course, is the rate of infection, and this is affected by uh, con uh, early isolation of cases. Um, if we are not able to isolate them early, this would mean that each case will be able to infect more individuals before they are isolated, and that would, in effect, uh, affect or that would affect the reproduction number, uh, which is related to the rate of infection. So. Um, Essentially, what this means is if we are able to reduce the, you know, the, the reproduction number by um, isolating early, yes, we can have a better response. Uh, unfortunately, what we're seeing is that, uh, I mean, we're not aware of the specifics of the contact tracing uh, situation because that is, uh, you know, that is information that LGUs have in terms of the, you know, the, the resources and the efficiency of the contact tracing. But what we're seeing is the effect that, you know, when we see the reproduction numbers increasing, that means that, um, you know, some of the interventions may not be working as effectively as before. Um, so, so, that's, uh, so what, what I'm saying basically is that that has, in a, in a way, it's already factored in the model. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. David. Question from Julius Leano. I'll read it out, but uh, Dr. Burba replied to him already. Sinovac is the most widely used vaccine in the Philippines. Why are there limited information, at least locally, 
about it and why is it not usually part of the more recent studies comparing the different vaccine brands? And uh, I think the reply of uh, Rina is, um, let me check the reply somewhere here. Sabi ko ma'am, ano po, uh, 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 the other countries don't study Sinovac kasi they don't have experience on it yet. But uh, uh, with the project that we're doing right now, we promised at least our sponsors, which is the DOST and the DOH, that as soon as we have uh, interim data, we'll be sharing it with the public. With the with them and with the public. Just Thank you. Uh, another question um, to Dr. Burba from Vic Ilag. Social distancing, masking, shielding, and quarantine do not reduce viral load. Povidone iodine, uh, also known as betadine, and other early intervention methods have been shown to reduce the viral load and in some cases, mortality, which are supported with clinical trials. Early reduction of viral load and limiting viral multiplication prevents progression of the disease transmission as well as the generation of new variants. Why aren't these approaches included as part of the prevention strategy, especially given the Philippines limited sequencing capacity and limited vaccine supply. I think this has always been the concern of Vic. We can do modeling, forecasting, predicting, and um, we can do um, all kinds of preventive measures. But I think he's uh, really thinking more about uh, protective uh, measures, uh, more aggressive uh, protective measures, such as uh, those that will reduce viral load. So Dr. Burba, would you like to answer this? So, Yes, we're with we're one with you and with everyone, with the consumers, with the stakeholders on really rapidly dropping the viral load. Kasi kung pagbaba natin, uh, I think um, clearly baka ma magiba yung um, natural history ng COVID infection. Um, but but sir, kasi even if you like look at data on povidone iodine and other similar similar oral disinfectants hindi kasi solid yung evidence eh. and uh, <clears throat> when the group dun sa non pharmaceutical part of the covid guidelines would uh, uh, discuss it informally or formally um panayni away po yung benefits i guess pero uh, i i answered mom Giselle na uh, we had a recent a webinar slash workshop na Southeast Asian One Health uh, approach and actually specifically talked about oral health and the use of all these uh, oral agents. Kasi sa Japan po ginagamit to eh. Um, and uh, its implementation in the Philippines. So we did agree that we were going to revisit the data and weigh the benefits slash cost slash risks uh, versus everything else. Um, kasi parang napipicture nyo po ba, pagka, let's say, we, the public, I think the public communication of such strategies that we will, like, bring out to everybody needs to be very clear. Kasi minsan nako-confuse po yung communication and really what works and what may work. So, ganun. So, uh, right now, um, there's some hesitation. For example, uh, sabihin mo, oh, sige, mag-gargle tayo lahat with COVID-19 iodine because there's some data that seems to show it will reduce the amount of virus in our nasopharyngeal and nasal and uh, oral area and will reduce, maybe trans reduce the transmission. Pero pag na-confuse na yung general public dun sa strategy na yun and versus masking and may opt to gargle and not use the mask, baka we might end up like having a um, really more difficult control of the situation. So again, it needs to be maybe like a unified set of strategies na maganda yung 
um, communication to the public. So, so as I said, uh, hindi naman tapos. Everything is fluid. We're going to revisit all of this data and then um, uh, make recommendations. Thank you, uh, Nina. I think Vic here has um, some um, suggestion. You might want to check the COVID positive case numbers of Los Baños since um, his group tried to get the local government in March to actively promote the use of povidone iodine. Okay. So um, are there any more questions from the audience? Please raise your hand. It's now uh, 11.30, so we've um, yes, run yeah. a side chat for two and a half hours. Yes, is that, did I, I Glenn, please. I, thank you very much. Uh, yes. I just want to comment, uh, I just want to go back to modeling. I don't quite agree with Father Ostriatico where models are wrong. Actually, models are conceived or uh, created for a given purpose. So as long as they could be simple or sophisticated, but as long as they satisfy the purpose, then it's not incorrect, like hypothesis, uh, your alternative hypothesis. And then it's quite useful for that matter. So I think uh, when we do modeling, I do modeling a lot for water resource systems, where we really have to recognize uncertainties and even measurement error. So my, maybe I'll ask, I, I don't, I'm not so familiar with what uh, Dr. Guido are, are doing, but uh, I don't know if it's a pure statistical model or a predator prey system model with infected model in the recovered and uh, so much susceptible and so on. And to what extent you have a sort of a deterministic epidemiological or biological or a viral kind of a mechanistic uh, component in the model. Because you can really create a model that could be a combination of statistical with some uh, stochastics and then with a physically based uh, from a biological, uh, epidemiological or whatever model you have. That's why I think it's uh, mentioned by Professor Emeritus uh, Pernia where, you know, to what extent you can really capture the mechanis mechanistic uh, framework of viral uh, production and so on. And thirdly, I don't know to what extent uh, if you do this type of model, I don't know, the spatial granularity, I think as mentioned by uh, Dr. Robante, as well as the uh, temporal, how, how often you update the, the model such that, you know, you, you, you also update not only your forecast, you update the forecast, but you update even the parameters. So it's like a combined state parameter estimation with measurement error and uncertainty uh, components, just like when you do Kalman filtering, when they do space uh, navigation. So maybe I'll ask uh, Dr. Guido David regarding those two later comments. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the, the question, uh, Dr. Tabias. Um, uh, yes, we do update our parameters uh, regularly. Uh, and I, I want to again mention what was uh, mentioned by um, Father Nicanor. Um, he did um, present a, uh, a model based in MIT. This was last year, and he was using it to make projections. And the model is far more sophisticated. Uh, it has some machine learning components, and it takes uh, into account uh, many state variables. Um, but we, what we know, and I'm sure all our other modelers are aware of this, that uh, such models uh, take in, uh, factor in a lot of variables, spatial variables, um, et cetera. And it, it, they take time to, to process, to run. Um, and they're highly sensitive to the input parameters, to the input data. And that's why for um, uh, most of our modeling, we, uh, we use a much simplified uh, stream down uh, model that is uh, crude, uh, but we believe is, um, well, has a high degree of um, uh, projection, uh, projection accuracy because we have um, validated it and uh, recalibrated it um, over the past year. But what you're saying about the you know, 
uh, spatial aspects. Um, this is part of some research that we are conducting. So yes, those are uh, very good inputs, and we, you know, we thank you for that. Um, you know, looking at the effects of mobility and you know density, um, these are some um, factors that you know a lot of uh, modelers in the world are. You know, trying to study, trying to find you know relationships with with the with the spread of the pandemic. So, so thank you so much for your um, suggestions. Just a quick comment, uh, Giselle. The reason I mentioned about the the how often you update and how how then you also quantify uncertainty or measurement error is maybe the government should be uh, you know aware of that that you, you cannot be perfect definitely, and whatever sampling error you have or uh, forecast error you have, maybe that should be known to them that, you know, that's why you, you cannot be like, uh, right. we cannot, you know, tell them what's correct or we're exact and all. Thank you very right. much. Yes, I agree. And uh, just to add to that, um, there is, uh, of course, a level of uncertainty with our own projections. And uh, as I uh, sort of mentioned in my presentation earlier, uh, we believe that our projections are actually a lower bound for the Know, for the actual number of cases. That's why, and, and we have been uh, doing this for some time now. And that's why uh, a lot of times when we make projections, the actual numbers actually exceed uh, the projections. So, I mean, so, so we, we, we strongly believe that it's a, it's, it's a lower bound or it's a lower estimate for the uh, um, uh, actual number of cases that occur. So we, we actually recalibrated this sometime during the process. Um, early on last year, we were trying to get, you know, a closer to the mean value, but, you know, when you get the mean value, sometimes you, you don't hit the projections. Um, sometimes it gets criticized because, oh, you, you know, you over projected. Uh, for example, last year when we had this, uh, you know, with the uh, spokesperson, Harry Roque, and he said, you know, they, we didn't reach 40,000 cases, but we were actually within 10%, uh, which is usually the uh, margin of error that we're um, going for. Um, but you know, the the bottom line is that it's usually the the end result, whether we're going to have a surge or can we see a surge coming, and uh, what do we do about uh, the coming surge? So, and it's less about the accuracy, but more about the the qualitative. Um, features of the pandemic that we're looking at. But thank you, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, Dr. Gidan. Thank Absolutely. You. So um, uh, Glenn um, and Guido, I think uh, for those in the audience who are, um, well, uh, new to complexity science or data science, uh, that seems to be um, like um, an underlying thread that uh, you look at patterns and trends, and it's not so much about the accuracy or the precision, but uh, but looking at the trends in your uh, graphs, Guido, you you showed um, a level of 500 moving all the way to 2,500. Am I right? Yes, that's correct. Yes. Over in in a in a short period. So right. whether it's uh, 500 to 2,000 or 2,400 to 2,500, given uh, the uncertainties of your uh, data points, you know, the report, the, 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 the two other uh, data uh, uh, points from uh, the DOH, I, I think uh, the trend is very clear. And that is also what Father uh, Nicanor uh, stressed. And I think that um, what you're saying is an overreaction uh, to uh, the pandemic is better than an underreaction, right? An overestimation is better than an underestimation, right? And uh, you've uh, shown that um, your predictions are actually um, uh, exceeded by the reality as reported by, well, uh, well, the DOH and um, uh, their uh, actions afterwards. So, I think um, it's important that um, we have these uh, meetings and we're able to open uh, the discussion or the discourse uh, to all, not just uh, to our scientists in the various disciplines, but also to um, uh, our policymakers, as well as to uh, members of the media, as well as all the persons who are interested. For one, one thing, COVID has um, 
uh, increased uh, what I would call scientific literacy, which is um, a major goal uh, uh, in society. So um, if there are no more questions, we will uh, soon end this event. And uh, at this point, um, I would like to thank um, everyone who attended uh, today's event, uh, especially uh, thanks to the speakers. And uh, I would say that PASE is a champion of science, volunteerism, and uh, Benji Valiero is one of our active members. And he talked to us about um, pursuing independent science uh, without uh, getting paid for uh, what you're doing. And that's what we try to uh, do in PASE. And um, uh, we are all uh, uh, with a DNA or uh, with an origin in, uh, uh, in academe. So we come from uh, uh, different universities in PASE, in the Philippines and uh, in the United States and elsewhere in the world. And um, we uh, promote open, uh, discourse and uh, transparent uh, sharing of the data, okay, within uh, data privacy uh, laws, okay? Now, um, I think at this point, I would like to hear from um, a former Secretary of Health, Malalet Dairit, and maybe if he's still around, an IATF advisor. This is uh, Dr. Ted Arbosa. So may I hear from Manolet and from Ted? Manolet, are you there? What about Ted Arbosa? Hi, uh, thank you for recognizing. Huh? Yes, yes. I've been listening at the discussions and uh, my yeah. field of expertise is emergency and disaster medicine. And uh, one of the things we study in epidemiology is uh, the concept of risk communication. The big problem with private groups and scientists making an analytics and then making it public without publishing methodology is that we end up creating panic and confusion, which is exactly what a government agency or a response for a pandemic shouldn't be happening. So if we as scientists want to help, the way and the forum is through uh, uh, fora like this or publications in a peer-reviewed journal. And that's when their, your subject can be discussed. Uh, I also suggest that uh, data uh, done by this private group of scientists be submitted to IATF regularly. In fact, we invite uh, this group. For example, Father Nick attends our vaccine vaccination rollout and we listen to his presentations. So it's very important wherein there is timing of communications. And this is where the claims of, let's say, Dr. Salvania of, uh, about uh, debates, because if you attend the IATF meetings, the debates are very long. The debates and the contentions are, and no one is right and no one is an expert be because this is new. Uh, Speaking another one, and uh, I'm in another meeting also. So, so I mean, I, I I just like to make sure that uh, when scientists speak out, they they must be first publishing it or showing their data, and then making an announcement uh, in the media. So that not the other way around. So it's not the other. Way. And this is where the confusion lies because, uh, for example, my team I developed the UP COVID nineteen pandemic response team. Peter Kaiton is there and Jomar. We publish everything on the UP website and the ngov.ph. So all the methodologies are there. So if other peers want to review it, they can uh, contact them and analyze them. When we submit it and when we're asked, we go to Malacanang, we also present it. I also use it in terms of advising the National Task Force. This is how we scientists can help uh, you know, the government in terms of operational response. It's very important not to compete with them not in the time of pandemic, because if you, the government has assigned people that do analytics and John Wong is here, he's doing the tech, the faster is there. We do not compete with them. We actually 
support them. So the idea, like for example, the Israelis, when they came here, they said their modelers were three, three universities, three of their top universities were asked to model. And each one, sometimes one university is correct, sometimes the other university is correct, sometimes the third university is correct. So this is still new. This data analytics and data science is still new. And in the field of epidemiologic response, uh, we are still experimenting, basically just like the mRNA vaccine. So I think the uh, confusion creates to the public and the emotion it creates to the public when you, when you state that according to our models, there will be 100,000 cases or 80,000 cases. Uh, you are not helping the risk communication that government is doing in terms of making sure that there is no panic, that Thursday doesn't happen and people don't go see exactly what happens to fake news. They said you won't be given a Yuda if you don't have a vaccination. So what happens is, uh, what happens is uh, you will be, uh, they all went to the vaccine center. So this is the type of problem that, this, uh, that you unknowingly can do as a scientist. So it's very important to me that you allow the risk communication to happen to the IATF and the organizations that do it. And then if we scientists want to help, we give our computations and our suggestions to them. If they don't listen, that's the time we come out and say, we protected it, we gave this to them, and this is how uh, we, we think the government is wrong. And then you criticize the government based on the science you do. That's all, Giselle, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Erbosa. I'd oh, like there. to request uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Wright and uh, perhaps Dr. Vallejo to respond to this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good morning to all and thank you, uh, Dr. Ted. Um, th this, I, I guess, is the, the struggle of independent science uh, advice no? and with government. And uh, be rest assured and to inform the, the community here, we have been working very closely with the Department of Health uh, we've had uh, numerous engagements. Uh, before we spoke in public in a government station, uh, uh, the week before we had informed the, uh, the Secretary of Health uh, in a meeting with the business sector um, hosted by Dr. Uh, by, Mr. by Presidential Advisor Joey Concepcion. Dr. Edsel Salvania was also there uh, together with our team. Uh, before we spoke, we had already submitted a report to the media. But uh, we hear Dr. Ted Vosa. We hear him, and um, we will work even harder to improve our coordination with uh, with uh, our, our stakeholders in government. Uh, we are one with government in the collective fight against COVID-19, <clears throat> and our role has always been to provide weekly. We have been doing weekly reports since September uh, 2020, and we have not. And sometimes we do three reports a week. Um, while this is our part-time job, uh, we're lucky that many of uh, the members of uh, Okta have no social life, so they like doing these monitoring reports. Uh, much of the job is volunteer work, and uh, we hope that the, the, the NTF appreciates, and I think many of the cabinet members who are linked also with Okta, in a sense through personal relationships, have all often uh, expressed okay, the appreciation. But yes, um, uh, it, ha there ha it has to be explained that in this particular case, Dr. Ted, we didn't want, Okta didn't want another repeat of March and April, the surge that uh, not only um, uh, cost us a lot of lives, but also uh, livelihoods. We wanted to sound, okay, to, to um, flag no? the trends that we were uh, seeing and alert, uh, you, the decision makers, no? And uh, in a sense, our effort, uh, while our, our data was never, and Dr. Ted can uh, assure us of this, was never discussed in the IATF, the Department of Health and their excellent modelers saw the same thing. And in a few days after we spoke about it, it was confirmed uh, through their, the model of the Department of Health that indeed there was exponential growth, it could threaten our uh, healthcare system, and that it was best to take a precautionary uh, uh, measures by way of an early lockdown uh, to save lives and livelihoods. And that was the Department of Health, not Okta. And, uh, the, and it, it, this is an affirmation that it's not about Okta or the Department of Health, it's the majesty of science. When science 
uh, you know, the best of science is, is provided us, we are guided well. And uh, this is a testament that to, to the reality that we all have to work together also as scientists, because what we produce, as Dr. Ted is saying, is important to the life of our country and into the collective struggle against COVID-19. So the science won in the end, and it has uh, informed and uh, created a, 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 an appropriate response from government. So that is my response to uh, Dr. Ted, and we, we commit, OCTA commits to working even more closely uh, with the Department of Health and maybe, maybe even the IATF if we're invited. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rai. Dr. Vallejo, any thought on this as a science advisor? It's <laughs> independent. Okay, uh, I'd like to give some unsolicited uh, suggestion. No? Uh, kasi yan ang trabaho naman ng mga science advisors, especially the independent ones. Uh, there's this question of uh, my colleague Jomar Rabahante about accountability of modelers. No? Uh, I have been reviewing the different uh, systems for science advice on COVID-19 uh, in the 17 uh, escape countries. So we had to read to all the cases. No? And what is important here is the following. No? Modelers uh, form an important uh, interpretation, data analytics, and generation of scientific information for science advice on on COVID-19. One of the suggestions that came out in all of these consensus meetings namin, uh, is that the modelers should more or less uh, do their job, but they should not be the ones fronting for policy suggestions. No? Uh, that could be left to an independent uh, science academy, or if there are systems within the bureaucracy that can allow for the taking in of independent science advice. I think kulang tayo sa culture natin yan. Eh. That, has to be, uh, that has to be developed. Then uh, the modelers and everybody working on COVID-19 can come up to a science-informed consensus that will identify all the policy options to government. So hindi yung diretso tayo sa media, diretso tayo sa social media. I think that would, uh, that would address the big question of uh, extended scientific review. Okay, uh, and also uh, it would be seen by the public as all the science the science experts coming up with a more or less single view, because this is the major problem uh, for COVID nineteen. No, wala kasi tayong mga sistema for giving science advice in most countries in the world. So each country in the world had to come up with ad hoc. <laughs> temporary arrangements and the temporary arrangements have exposed some of the political consequences, political vulnerabilities for the science community as well as the government okay, and the government ministries or department. So uh, we have to avoid that complication because uh, it will be will result a negative outcome for the public following health, uh, health advice from uh, the authorities. I think we have to work out the system with that and perhaps Paase could, uh, could be a venue for coming up with those systems of reporting and accountabilities of whatever science information for, for COVID. I think that's my, the last thing I'll say now. Oh. Okay, thank you, Benji. Michael, should we uh, uh, have our closing uh, remarks? I have two messages uh, to share. Uh, Michael, what about you? Yeah, you. yeah, yeah. Uh, Professor Giselle, I would just like to thank Paase for giving us this opportunity to present the science that uh, OCTA is involved in, as well as our motivation for doing it and our ultimate goal. We are here to work together within our team and also our team working together with scientists from all over the Philippines and in fact, all over the world as uh, Dr. Vallejo and Dr. Ostriaco are doing. So uh, again, we thank you and we would like to look forward to more opportunities to participate either as a group or individually in Paase. Right now, I can tell you that individually, and in collaboration, uh, in small, uh, small configurations, uh, we in Okta are doing our own researches related to COVID and healthcare in, uh, in general. So we will be happy to share this, uh, the results of these researches with Paase and uh, 
Again, thank you for all the uh, attendees to the media that uh, covered this. I hope we were able to explain and uh, we can use our model, the other model, and compare it with each other to come up with the best solution for the, our country and help alleviate the impact of this pandemic amongst us. I'd like to thank the uh, four speakers of OCTA. You have done a great job. We really understand now how, and I hope our countrymen through our uh, influencers who are here would be able to understand what we are doing. Thank you very much. Ma'am Giselle? Yes, thank you so much, Michael, Guido, Father Nicanor, uh, Regina, Nina, and uh, Benji for your uh, very informative talks. And I think that with these talks, you will be ready for your congressional hearing. <laughs> yes. Now I'd like to uh, share a screen here to address a concern of um, Dr. Ted Urbosa, which is uh, to um, uh, our research um, uh, more public, transparent, and um, well, at the same time, keep it independent, which is uh, something that I share strongly with um, Benji Vallejo. Okay, so um, uh, academics uh, think op openly and transparently, or we are into open-minded or universitas thinking. We engage in open discourse, and after that, we uh, then uh, come up with our um, research and our uh, results and conclusions that we uh, subject to peer review uh, through publications. So I would like to plug in this journal of uh, the PASE. So uh, this is Sai Eng J, formerly Philippine Science Letters. It's an online open access journal, and it has uh, this genre of um, articles on modeling. So we accept modeling papers, and we also have a category of um, articles known as prospectives and perspectives. And if you uh, examine the um, uh, board of um, editors, you will see that many of them are internationally recognized scientists and engineers. So this is one way for us to uh, publish our research and uh, get it subjected to um, peer review or review by uh, scientists, our fellow scientists, before it's publicized uh, to the general public. Okay. Now, um, I wanted to uh, call former Secretary of Health Manolet Dairit, but he has left our group for uh, another meeting. Now, finally, I have to let everyone know that I'm actually in Massachusetts, visiting my daughter who works at MIT. And you heard the news about uh, the Delta variants and the surges here in Massachusetts. But in MIT uh, and um, well, in universities here, it's mandatory that all researchers, faculty and students have the PCR test every week. Otherwise, you're not allowed to enter the premises. Now, many of you know that uh, the Broad, which is between Harvard and MIT, actually uh, was responsible for a great majority of the PCR testing that was done in the United States. And um, that's because of their you know, PCR uh, machines, their next gen uh, uh, sequencing machines. But anyway, I think uh, this is something that um, um, Dr. Ted Arbosa and others uh, who are um, influential in uh, government now would like to, um, would, would consider that um, massive PCR testing would uh, still uh, continue or be expans expanded beyond what Red Cross uh, and Michael T have done. And uh, that then provides uh, good data to our modelers and at the same time, um, well, gives us the uh, right cues to try to control uh, the uh, pandemic, okay? Uh, with contract, contact tracing uh, 
gone afterwards. So with that, uh, may I thank once again, everyone for joining us today, especially our four Octa speakers and our host, Michael, and all those who contributed to the discussion today. Thank you. Good day, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah.